<laughs> Welcome everybody to Legendary Tales. We are officially back with a new series, Soul Forged. I hope everyone watched episode zero on on YouTube. Uh, speaking of which, uh, YouTube. Um, yeah, if you want to go watch episode zero, we did a little episode before this so they could learn how to use the system and things like that. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, a little bit of recap about episode zero. Essentially, the party met in a very awkward and hilarious situation. Uh, the, bo uh, the bounty master Sinhald told them, hey, we have an issue. Um, we need you to deal with this necromancer in the woods because he killed a bunch of the wild spirits who are druids in the area that produce that make the wood grow faster and things like that. So they pushed and um, <clears throat> they went into this mausoleum. They found these crazy creatures called rattle mines that explode bone everywhere and destroy things. Um, and on top of that, they went to, um, and found this giant ogre, uh, necromancer who was soul stitching. And they found out that soul stitching is the worst thing that you can do. You take someone's soul, you put it into an item. It's a, it's a separate form of magical enchantment other than temper. There's a lot of lore dropped in the first episode. I highly recommend watching that. Um, but we ended our last episode in the fact that they spent the night in the druid, uh, oh, the druid hall essentially a giant tree that they made and put buildings into and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> and they spent the night there. It was warm. It was fantastic. So uh, where we are is they have just woken up. Oh, yeah, and they retrieved the uh, Eevee, uh, received this magical item that is just a little tiny drop of temper on the end of a sprig that, that spawns good berries. So they can feed a party of up to four people every day forever with this magical item. Essentially, the, the berries regrow themselves overnight. Um, and that was one of the big things they got. They got a little bit of extra money because soul stitching was involved and they didn't know. Um, and yes, uh, that's where we are. Uh, if you would like to look at the maps and the things I'm talking about at the bottom in the about section of the stream, I have the maps organized by uh, different series. If you want to look at their character sheets, they're on the left side on the overlay. Uh, they are from D&D Beyond and we import them over. Um, and if you want to know some more stuff, I will be dropping a bunch of lore into the Discord after this as well. If one of my mods would like to make a Soul Forged recap channel, that'd be great. Um, did I miss anything? Anybody? Um, and as far as we know, I'm going to do a little bit of a character introduction for episode one. Um, Evie is an Eladrin. She's a seasonal elf. Uh, they don't really know what her powers are yet, so I'm not going to spoil that. You haven't really... Other than being able to cast spells, they don't really have a lot of information outside of that. So we're going to leave it at that. Um, Vidar is a Warforged something. They're not really sure. They, they see him throw blue knives and stuff like that. They're not really sure exactly what he does. But he's a Warforged made of the most valuable material in the world called Temper. Their Temper is a metal that is um, the only ability to enchant weapons and items and things like that requires a material called temper in order to do that well vidar is made of that is just made of it his whole body everything about him is made of it uh lower is a uh a fighter lizard folk and he dresses extremely well that's the most thing we know about. and he has a maul and then you have you have picked up that great sword from the skeleton king um uh anything else you're hungry he's a hungry boy um, that's one thing we know about him. And then Technician Rap Rap, R3P4, R4P, is a, another Warforged who is made of a significantly less amount of temper, a basically new generation of Warforged, uh, who has a pet robot dressed as a fox. Um, and that's what we know. And he has a light crossbow. We don't know a whole lot about everybody yet, but we'll get there. You guys know that. Um, so let's get into episode one. We have to start off with the classic Legendary Tales music obviously let me find it uh forest day and if you guys haven't watched a lot of my series every series has this as the sort of ambient music as i'm doing a little bit of world building and we're pushing in a specific direction let me switch to the crag so i can show you where we currently are um actually i'm going to do world map first so that we can introduce everyone to where we are in the world let's go ahead and activate the world map and then we'll go back into it um Okay, I can't see it, but the, the okay. So, um, that being said, here's the world. 
it's huge. And each of the different factions and empires are located in their own specific color. Uh, you have the northwest, you have the unknown territory, the war bands that is shrouded in mystery for some reason. Verdant Guard has a ton of resources. And each of these maps are in the about section as well. The crag is where we currently are located in the southwest, on the southwestern islands of this world. Let me go back to that real quick and I can show you exactly where we are. We are in a specific area to the southwest on the western island near the capital of Skjornsorn. And Skjornsorn leads to Turfor, and Turfor is known for its magical wood that it can it can export and things like that. Um, it's a very beautiful area, and the whole world has settled in on the fact that it's winter. So the entire world is in winter. Um, it is in the depth of winter, so we're roughly in the, in the middle of the of in the middle of the season, and it's a beautiful time. Um, it is cold in the lands of the crag, but not as cold as it can be in other areas. There are other areas that are way colder than the current place that we're in. Specifically to the north of Artstat is very cold. Um, and there's a lot of beautiful things to be had here, except for obviously soul-stitching necromancers are not the greatest. Um, and uh, that's where we currently are. Um, they have talked to Bounty Master Sin Hall. They sort of gave them their first mission, that kind of thing. Um, you guys awaken the next morning. The sun comes up over uh, over the eastern tree line, just past the little volcano island that's to the east of you guys that you could barely see. Um, and keep in mind that the, the relative distance between that island and everything else is about 200, 300 miles, 250, 300 miles. Uh, between you and that island so you could sort of see it it produces a little bit of ash um, the blizzard from the previous day has subsided there's about eight inches eight inches more snow on the ground you are awakening in the druid uh, uh, what did I call it last time I want to call it a coven but they're not witches so on en enclave. Enclave. enclave the druid enclave thank you um, you awaken in the druid enclave and it is absolutely beautiful the next morning it is so peaceful and it is very interesting in the fact that it's so peaceful you could hear birds that you could hear everything yesterday it was a little bit more loud today you wake up early in the morning it's probably seven or eight in the morning um you walk outside and surprisingly just about to open the door is bounty master sinhald straight up comes up to you and says good morning who's opening is is who's walking are you guys all walking out at once who's the early who's the earliest person to wake up i would assume that it's either evie it's, or it's vidar evie. evie or vidar would it's probably be the, 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 the earliest people i say that vidar and i are probably up first yeah yeah i don't sleep so that's true i also don't necessarily sleep that's, yeah, you are an elf. <laughs> There's only one yeah. person that actually sleeps at this party. <laughs> um, but uh, you go to open the door, and Vidar is probably directly behind you. And uh, Bounty Master Sinhald in his big fur, uh, his big leather, big leather shirt, um, sort of like a tank top almost. Um, his uh and his boots and his pants or whatever comes up to you it's just a notable thing that bounty master sinhar is a massive go goliath that doesn't wear a shirt he wears enough skin he wears enough coverings to be warm but not enough to cover his massive physique and he looks down at or he looks you could look him in the eye right or you're almost there right evie he looks down on mm -hmm. you obviously um right but <clears throat> he says good morning I was just about to come get you. Come and get us for what, exactly? Oh, um, well, let's just say, uh, today's going to be a good day. Um, I have been talking to someone, and, uh, we have, uh, more or less come in contact with someone, and, um, they've requested help in the, uh, capital of Artstat, specifically. Um, one of the emissaries to uh, the young king, Shiram, has sent an envoy and has requested help from specifically a group of people from our nation to assist them in uh, moving 
this emissary around the world to sort of talk about trade negotiations between different um is it too loud sorry um yeah. so, something happened there uh, yeah apparently uh <laughs> oh oh no my cat my cat did it i don't know what she changed hold on let me uh, shoot i apologize guys oh my gosh Stop talking, please. Please, stop. I don't. So anyway, the DM cast uh, Thunderwave. Oh, we do actually have an emote for my cat now, if you want to do, like, 95 cupcake. She's on there now. So, if she show when she shows up, you can do that. I apologize. She was walking around <laughs> the back. I didn't know that she was going to do that. It's, 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 it, it's in and out now, is what it's doing. It's, I have no idea what that me? is. No, no idea. Loose cable, something like that. Nothing. I, I fell in the role for Devin. I don't think I could switch between Sinhald and Sinhar as much as he does, though. I'm just going to have to stick with one. That's it, I think. No longer have it. Does Cupcake many, make any on-camera appearances? He does. Every, every time. Every time. Chat says you're back. Am I back? Yay! Yeah, you, okay. You are, yeah, you've been back for, with us for Okay, a but you can hear me now, right? Is it better? Is it better than it was? Because I don't want it to be Just loud. Move like two inches away from your mic. You'll be good. How about now? Is that better? Wonderful. Okay, I good. So, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, that's what I'm used to. Apparently, she. what did you do, Cat? She fixed something. Either way, and I, I apologize. Um, I will not raise my voice if I can help it. So, um, <clears throat> we're looking for someone to follow around this envoy and help him negotiate with the different people and um, essentially just escort him because the people of the Crag are proud and we are resilient and things like that we're good fighters so uh i have volunteered your party to help How with this with this emissary and you will be paid a set amount per week what is the set amount uh you will get a hundred gold per week for your party and when it comes to okay. living expensive that is an insane amount of money Because on average, most people, regular people, spend a gold per week to live. Okay. Well, we know that Vidar is a bit of a light finger when it comes to money. So I bet we're both on board. I think we have to wait for the other two to poke their heads out and get their opinion oh, on it. Absolutely. I'm uh, just saying that the guy is sort of waiting at the capital. So... So we should get them up. If you go along. get them up, we can start heading that direction. I will not be coming with you, but I will lead you. I will, I will go to the capital. I All will right, go I'm with you. I'm going to go and... mercilessly bang on the doors of, uh, of Lorshik and uh, Rip Rap over here. Doom, 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 doom. I, uh... Oh, no. It is the police. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rip Rap, uh, Rip Rap just just very calmly uh, answers the door and um, uh, hello. Good morning. We have a new mission that we can go on. I need you to come downstairs and get the info so you can let us know if you want to come with or not. Okay. Um, I'll head downstairs and uh, I assume I'm getting the info from um, uh, Rob. Ba Bounty Sinhalt. Master Sinhalt? Yeah. Bounty Master Sinhalt. He, um, he, reiterates, <laughs> Every time. he reiterates everything he told Evie. Okay. To you. Um, Loer Shik, are you getting up? 
Am I in the same room as Rep Rap? What were we doing in there together? That's up to you. I was staring blankly at the wall because that's how I sleep. <laughs> sure. I, I I wake up as well, but a little bit more startled and defensive. Uh, and who, who was knocking on the door? Was it Evie? Is that right? It was Evie, yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I ask Evie, Evie, uh, are we going to grab some meat together today? No meat today. Just come downstairs, please. Why? Do not enrage me. Come downstairs. And but then I leave. I'd I'm like downstairs at this point. Nope, not listening to you. You can keep talking, but I'm just going to continue downstairs. I I grab my maul and I drag it behind me and reluctantly walk down to go meet with them, but making it very clear and loud that my maul is right next to me the entire time. Okay. Um, as you're like bringing the 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 mall down the stairs, one of the druids looks at you and goes, "Are you serious right now? Could you at least pick it up? Excuse me. Pick up the mall. Don't." Um, as we're walking down the stairs, <sighs> go on. You interrupting me? I pick up the go mall on. and I place it on my back and I just I give the druid like a a very serious glare. And he, he, I walk over. he walks behind you and casts him. He's casting a mending spell all the way back to your room to repair the damage you've done to the tree. I, I, I can anyone tell me why I've been rudely woken up? I would first like to remind you how kindly the people here have been to us and not to be rude to them. You're reminding me of kindness. Mm -hmm. You didn't even thank them for the wonderful twig that they gave you. I didn't quite understand the wonderful twig. I do now, and I'm very grateful. You're telling me when your your mother gives you a a wonderful present during Elfmas, you you don't say thank you. Don't speak about my mother. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then Bounty Master Sinhald re refers yet again the whole situation to everyone now that you're all there. Uh, Vidar, have you said anything this whole time, or have you just been chilling? I've just been chilling. Okay, mostly just taking in some information. Thinking, yeah. I I, I think uh, are, are we gonna be on our way now? We can be. I have a uh, uh, I have horses outside. We have a little bit of a caravan that we have to take down there anyway for supplies. We're delivering some of the uh, turfor turforite. Sometimes they call it. Um, <clears throat> they're bringing some down to the Skjornsorn anyway. So, if you'd like to join us, you can. I'm on board. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, he walks outside, and a lot of the snow has been moved. But surprisingly, one of like the horse-drawn... There's like a horse-drawn trailer that has three or four of these logs in it. And the logs themselves are gorgeous. On the outside, they have been stripped of the bark. But the inner wood is actually a light gray with bright red streaks running through it. Um... And it looks almost polished, but that's like how they naturally exist. And the these logs are about eight feet in diameter, by the way. They are that big. They're huge. Um, and there's three of them sitting on this trailer. And in front of the trailer, in front of the horses, there's actually a rudimentary snowplow. And uh, do it nat any, anyone with nature proficiency, if you're not proficient in nature, don't make a check yet. But uh, make me a check, a nature check real quick. Or an arcana check. If you are proficient in nature? If you are proficient in nature or arcana, you can roll one of those. Okay. Loershik, you... These horses are not natural. There's something off about them. That mm. you can't really quite I, put your... I take a closer look at the horse. <laughs> you walk up to the horse and realize that the armor, the barding, the horse is wearing a specialized like harness that fits to this carriage specifically. And the runes that are etched in the, the saddle and the harness are that of essentially a, a combination of runes that triples the strength of the horse. Magically. 
I... They're enchanted harnesses for two horses, and they both triple the strength of the horses carrying it. I call Vidar over and, and ask him to take a look. Go ahead and give me an Arcana check with advantage. Me? Vidar. No, Vidar specifically. Okay. Oh, this this is some of the most clever use of, of enchanting you've ever seen. So essentially they're taking away the need for ten horses and putting that much strength into two horses. This is this seems interesting. What, what, what do you think? Vidar? I think this is an efficient way of getting the trees to the capital. These horses will be very strong. How much meat do you think they could haul? <laughs> the one downside of this is that there is far less horse meat to go around if anything goes south. Vidar, <laughs> don't don't say that. You you would let the horse meat go to waste if something happened? These are obviously not horses meant for eating. Look at them. And these are these are a variation of Clydesdale, except they're woolly. So instead of a normal horse in the crag, you guys have woolly horses. So they're very long haired and they usually braid the hair around the sides and the back to all be very closely conditioned and then they have additional coatings on top of that with with clothing and all of their barding that they usually have is usually either thick leather or very thick wool but the horses themselves actually produce a wool like fur that's very thick because it's so cold here all the time so you're saying we have some very hairy meat yeah Oh. Okay. Hey, Rep Rap. Yes. Do you do you notice anything about these runes that you'd be interested in? Uh, insight, Arcana. What do you want? Arcana, please. Okay. Go ahead and take it at advantage as well. They don't. Uh, the it's not really the 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 runes that you're looking at specifically, but the craftsmanship on the harness is the best craftsmanship you've ever seen when it comes to leather. Like, there are no flaws in it whatsoever. And that's not just... Be most magical items have a sort of weather protection and, like, wear protection on them already by default because of the temper, the, pros the, the properties of the temper imbuing it with that. This is a truly master craftsman harness for these horses. Truly master crafted. Fascinating. These harnesses were made by a masterful craftsman. The runes appear to be giving these horses unusual strength. Vidar, do, you mentioned before that you know someone who might be a masterful craftsman who has experience working with temper. Do you think that this might be the same person? I don't know if the person that I spoke of was using temper. I don't know his methods. It's possible that it could be one and the same. By the way, did you ever tell them the name of the person, or are you keeping that still? No, oh, I haven't brought it up. Okay. Okay. Uh, where, where's yeah, where's the bounty master at this point? <laughs> uh, he is sitting on top of the the carriage that has the trailer on it with the logs. So he's he's doing he's pulling those horses. He's uh, reining those horses in. Um, I think we've done enough observing of the horses. Yeah. Maybe we should get going. Uh, they do have a set of horses for you guys. They have four horses that you guys can ride on. Um, and it's up to you whether or not you want to be in front of the carriage or behind the carriage or what you want to do. And then they have a handful of other sort of guard fighter types that are bringing up two in the front and two in the rear of the carriage. So it depends on if you guys want to be in front or behind. Um, keep in mind, if you are in front, you're going to have to go in front of the snowplow. And behind is going to be a much easier route altogether. Because um, the horses will be plowing snow on the way there as well. I'll go in front. Got yeah, behind, definitely. Behind. Yeah, I'll go in front. Okay, so we have Lower Schick and Evie in front, and then Technician and Vidar behind. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so here's our first version of this, and I got new emotes for this, guys. I'm going to say high or low. One of you says high, high or low. 
and then you roll, a, you do a slash R space D100, or in the upper left, there's that dice. On the left side, there's that dice. You can click that, and you can actually click on the D100. But I need one of you to choose high or low. High. Okay, so go ahead and roll that D100 for me, and then there we go. All right. So you have successfully rolled, um, and I don't have to tell you what that means because that's how this works. Um, man, everyone chose high. Okay, so um, you guys are moving, and along that road to the south, you have to sort of go and follow the uh, you have to follow the river all the way down. Um, they usually keep the roads close to the river so that if you're moving with pack animals or loads of people, you can get fresh water if you have to. Um, the rivers here very rarely ever freeze. It may be cold, but it never gets cold enough to completely freeze the rivers over. And as you're moving up in elevation towards Skjornsorn, Skjornsorn is on a sort of small plateau at the, on the edge of a lake. Um, and the city actually takes up a large space along that side. And you're traveling up along these roads, and the roads are very well kept and maintained. Um, you're not whether you're not sure whether it's magic or anything else like that. Um, I need all of you to make a perception check, please. Okay. Uh, technician and Vidar, you guys are sort of um, in the back looking around there are a massive amount of owls crowded you guys are you guys would get let me let me move your tokens a little bit farther um it takes you the first day's travel gets you to right around where uh technician's token is so i'm just gonna move you guys all around it but you guys are about here um you travel for the first day and during the day, it's very bright out. There's like a little bit of sun glare on you guys that are traveling up front. It's a little bit less on the bottom uh, or in the backside. Um, you're looking around, and Technician and Vidar, there is a tree, a dead tree, um, on your west or on your eastern side. So basically, on your left as you're traveling south. There, excuse me, there is a tree that has about 150 owls in it. Does that seem strange to you, Vidar? Yes, owls are not normally flock animals. Hmm. I would suspect that that many owls would be competing for food. Unless there's a food supply over there. As you're staring at it, Technician, you notice something else. At the very bottom of this tree, there is a gigantic bear-like creature sleeping at the base of it. Do I know what kind of uh, creature that That's is? That's an owl bear. Except this it's is a giant bear. version. A giant owl bear. There is a giant owl bear at the base of that tree. And this must be friends giant, with the owl. This giant owl bear appears to have this owls these owls as a as a sort of cohort as the majority of them keep dropping out dropping down and like fluttering around the base of the bear and like plucking out some of like the dead feathers and like tufts of hair while it's sleeping at the base of this tree and building some sort of nest around it It is winter. If we do not disturb the owl bear, it will probably not interact with us. <laughs> I, I agree. Guess I, haven't, I haven't made it this far in life by looking for trouble. Okay. Uh, you guys pass event, uh, uneventfully pass the owl, but the sleeping owl bear with its cohort of owls. Um, and as night begins to set around you guys, a lot of the guard-like, a lot of the guard-like characters um, begin to rush into the sh the short wooded areas around and begin to gather firewood. And one of them grabs a shovel and begins to shovel snow. Um, the guy with the shovel sort of looks at Loershik and says, 
Care to assist? Just a moment. I don't want you to work too hard, obviously. Why obviously? No offense, sir, but your clothes are a bit too clean. For I'm my never afraid to get tape. them dirty. Oh. I grab the shovel out of his hand. You have start. your own shovel. That's why I asked you. <laughs> you have your own shovel. Oh. oh. I, I, I toss it back to him and grab the shovel out of my back. And I, uh, I start shoveling. Not very helpfully, though, just to be clear. <laughs> Because apparently I'm a derp. Uh, so Angry I just shoveling. start shoveling snow back into where he was shoveling from. <laughs> uh, I apologize for asking for help. I'm sorry. And he's sort of still shoveling. And he's like, if you don't want to shovel, you don't have to. I don't care. I'm doing this so I we can have... shovel. Please give me some direction, though. A shovel outside of the circle I'm trying to generate. We're trying to make it area that we can camp and have a fire. Just shovel God, outward. I shovel a square instead. Close enough. <laughs> um, he gets back into uh, his sort of like thing. And then a bunch of people bring firewood. One of the guys um, who's very clearly either a druid or ranger type or something um, sort of begins to cast this strange spell that dries out all the wood in the middle. And then he sort of flicks his fingers and a, a fire appears and he begins to make and build up this campfire. Um, the horses are all tied to a nearby nearby tree that is actually quite a large. It's a pine tree. Um, and the horses all are, are by there. Um, uh, the bounty master uh, doesn't take off the strength armor from the horses and leaves them attached, but he brings these sort of strange water bowls with runes all over them to the to the big horses and gives them to them. He feeds all the horses. Um, he comes back to the camp and he says, Wow, you guys have actually finished working on a lot of things. Great. Um, and he pulls out from his pack this sort of strange contraption you've never seen before and throws it. And he goes... <laughs> and builds this like four person tent um off to one of the sides and it actually moves some of the snow out of the way and covers itself partially in snow he looks at you and says snow's an insulator for future reference and he um opens up his own tent and he sort of goes in size and preps and he says if any of you need a place to stay you can stay in here if you would like to i have actually a little bit of cordoning and things like that if you feel uncomfortable um for those of you that don't need to sleep and he looks directly at uh technician in vidar he says if you don't need a tent or whatever if you'd like to stand and stand guard that would be appreciated um i have i've i've interacted with a few of your types before and i think you need to be deactivated for a little while um, my guards could take sh night shifts if you want, but if you would like to help out, that would be more than well. That'd be more than happy if you wouldn't mind helping us out for a bit. I will assist. Are, are we like still pretty close to that owl bear? Where we? No, 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 no. This is miles from that. Miles from okay. that. That was just something that happened like right in the middle of the road, um, far closer, closer to that forest to the southeast, um, along that first bend past Tour Four. I would love to stay in your tent, sir. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And he sort of he sort of pulls back one of the curtains, like with say, and it looks like almost like a rug. Um, <clears throat> it looks almost like a rug, and he pulls it back, and this is like Doctor Who bigger on the inside things because it has like a roaring fire in the middle of it. You open up, and everything is really nice looking. There's like an actual like hardwood floor on the ground and things like that. Um, I walk inside the tent okay. and I start to get suspicious. I w I want to I want to check to see if it's if I can tell if anything's magical. Oh, the whole thing is magical. You don't even have to check. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, you don't even have to check anything. Are you, you sure? Yeah. Okay. If you'd like to um, check, you can. Is there something I should know about this tent? That it's magical. That's it. I'd like to just chuckle at Lorshik's um, obvious not having any experience with magic and kind of like move past him re a little bit reluctantly because I don't necessarily want to stay in the same tent as him. Um, and as he follows me in, I'm going to say, 
I hope you don't snore because it'll really break my meditation if you do. As long as you don't touch my meat in the middle of the night, we'll be fine. No chance of that. Well, welcome. Um, he sort of ushers both of you inside. I believe that we're going to eat in here, but for those of you who like to want to stay outside, everything will be fine as well. Um, and he sort of talks with his guards for a moment and explains that Vidar and Technician, if you guys would like to take part and watch, you're more than welcome to do that. Or if you want Loershik and Evie to do so, you can do that as well. But it's completely up to you. No, uh, Rep Rap is... is uh quite literally just going to take up post directly outside the tent. Just off to one side. Okay. <clears throat> that I will take the other side of the tent to that without saying anything, though. Unless somebody comes to move us, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure the guards would probably prefer us to be elsewhere, but this is the only spot we know to stand right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, on the sort of if you're facing the entrance on the right side, that's where Vidar has posted up. Um, and you can actually directly see the huge horses, the strength horses. Um, and there's definitely something more to them than what you expected. Almost as if they're augmented in a normal way, in an abnormal way, in addition to their armor. Because they're not breathing. They don't have steam coming off of them. Normally, workhorses like this are very steamy. They're very hot. But they don't appear to be breathing. I'm sorry. You said that you were telling that to Vidar since he's on that yes. side of the tent? Or? And then on okay. your side of the tent, you can see the four other horses that you guys are riding and then the additional four horses that the guards are riding um, all tied up and set to one tree. Um and they seem okay. They seem like normal horses. They're just chilling. Some of them have fallen asleep already. And they're sort of resting from the long day's walk. Uh, technician, um, gonna... will you make a perception check for me, please? Yes. Okay. Um, nothing seems out of place. You're sort of looking out, being a sentry, doing your thing. They seem fine. Nothing seems out of place. Uh, what are you doing right now, Vidar, as you're looking over all these things? I'm going to approach the horses and try to... I mean, obviously, I have pretty deep knowledge of things that don't breathe mm -hmm. and generate heat. So I'm going to try to check out to see if these are like war-forged horses or some other tricky go ahead and make a raw intelligence ability check for me please investigation do an investigation actually that's not any better it <laughs> should be the same role you're not sure but they they do appear to be organic you're just not really sure what the deal is hmm. after inspecting them for a few seconds and going yeah, I don't know anything about horses. Uh, I, I walk back around to the, the front of the t tent and... Uh, uh, rep, rep. Uh, I believe you're a little bit more keen on how things live. Mm. These horses over here don't appear to be living. All right. Uh, rep, rep's going to go uh, in investigate the horses. Okay. Uh. they have an illusion cast on them <clears throat> it's pretty powerful but it's not totally as you're sort of standing there you can actually hear mechanical noises coming from it and you're not really sure what the deal is because it does feel organic so you could definitely tell that it's sound vision and touch but you're not really sure what else it covers it's a fairly it's, it's semi-powerful it's not huge it's not super huge but it's a vidar, it's a powerful they, illusion spell uh, vidar they are machines however they appear to be covered in a very powerful illusion spell 
uh, that makes them appear to be horses, similar to your own technology. Sounds like a combination of my technology and also your dogs. My, my dog is wearing a fox. A dead fox. I don't know much about animals. That's why I got you in the first place. <laughs> These are technically not horses. <laughs> what are Evie and Loershik doing right now? <clears throat> I imagine we're kind of bickering in the tent over um, just this and that. Which side I, I get to sleep on? I stole a piece of jerky from uh, the bounty master hunter dude. Sinhald. It's obviously Sinhard. stinking up the tent as well. Rude. Sinhald. Rude. Sinhald. Uh, and I'm just gnawing away at it as Evie continues to, to run her elf mouth. Eladrian mouth, whatever. You were very much interrupting my meditation, as I very strictly requested that you don't do. You're upset at me. I, I, I need a break from this. I, I walk outside. I, I go out to the front of the tent to get some fresh air. Ah, peace. <laughs> um, you walk outside as lawyer Schick, I mean, um, technician and Vidar are sort of looking at the horses, having a conversation. Um, and the sun is setting. The sun is setting, and as the night begins to go, the the the, the wildlife around you begins to erupt in noise, um, the hooting of owls, the scurrying of creatures along the ground and in the trees that are nearby. Nothing off-putting, though, um, and the night actually passes relatively uneventfully. Um, there were a few sort of like strange prowling noises that were heard in the night by technician and Vidar, but upon investigation turned out to be harmless creatures like snow foxes and things like that. So nothing that's going to attack you guys specifically. Um, one of them investigated technician steel, steel defender for a moment because of the fur, like on the steel defender, but realized that there's something wrong with it and ran away immediately. <clears throat> and then upon looking at everything else this place doesn't seem to be particularly hostile um surprisingly a lot of the crag is very hostile both in wildlife and in natural aspects but you guys are far enough outside far enough outside of the region of the mountains the mountains are generally the more hostile areas whether it's a bullet or some sort of dragon there are known to be dragons in some parts of the mountain areas but they don't stray very far unless something wrong something really bad has happened and that hasn't happened in a very very long time evie when you were young which is a very long time ago if you're an elf um <clears throat> assuming well most elves reach maturity at the age of 80 so you've been around for a while um there's only been two or three dragons ever in the crag that have ever wandered outside the mountains um but nothing happens in the night. Just chilling. It feels good. A lot of the soldiers actually get full night's rest. So when they wake up the next morning, everyone is actually quite happy. Um, we wake up the next morning. The sun comes over the ridge again. Um, everyone packs up their stuff. Uh, one of the soldiers goes with his shovel, covers it all in snow again, tries to reset it to where it was. You want to leave things as you left them. Uh, as you Leave things as you found them is the key. Um, in some way, in some ways, with the crag, because they want to keep the natural beauty of this place uh, pristine, because everyone loves it. Um, and you begin your your second day. At the end of the second day, you'll be arriving in Skjornsorn. Is anyone doing anything specific before they reach the Skjornsorn, uh, the city of Skjornsorn? Um. Yeah, Rebrap kind of wants to talk to uh, uh, Bounty Master uh, Sinhald about the, the horses, see if he can get a little bit more information. He's just, he's fascinated by the craftsmanship. Okay. Um, as as your, uh, what exactly are you going to talk to him about? He says, oh, I'm going to, um, because I assume you pull up on your horse next to him, um, next yeah. to his sort of carriage. 
<laughs> Bounty Master Senhald, I noticed that these horses are not horses at all and are in fact uh, an illusion. Uh, but they are magnificent craftsmanship and appear to be mechanical to some degree. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me where they come from. Oh, um, we actually had these crafted by one of the great one of the great machinists. Um, he currently resides in <clears throat> in Trimbal to the northeast, um, where they procure vast amounts of ore, and he happened to find a small amount of uh, temper, and we requested this, and in Tour 4, um, we have a little bit of extra money, and in order to transport 10,000 pound trees, and three of them, you require a specific breed of horse that, to be fair, organic horses just can't do. So, these were commissioned uh, many years ago, and they have stayed with us ever since, and we have our own technicians, not quite like yourself, that uh, maintain them. But yeah, they were crafted many years ago by a master crafter in Trimbal. Do you know the master crafter's name? I do not. But if you give me some time, I can get, I can find it out. Thank you. Um, is anyone doing any? Is anyone else doing anything before? I'm polishing the scuff marks off of my maul from the enclave's floor, uh, so I'm just riding my horse and just rubbing my big stick. Okay. I I'm watching the horses uh, in the manner that it makes sense that they need large horses for carrying trees, but also suspicious that. They feel the need to disguise them. I'm having a little bit of a deja vu, kind of looking around, because I grew up here, so just being on this path um, is reminiscent of something when I was a child. Oh, interesting. So you're sort of lost in thought in the fact that you have a lot of memory here. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um it's very strange to you, Vidar, that they would they would cover something like that up. But there is a part of you that realizes that the amount of money they spent on these things, after probably overhearing a little bit of that conversation, the amount of money that this would cost just in temper alone would probably be many years of salary for a regular craftsman. So disguising it makes it easier for people to realize that they are it makes it harder for them to realize how valuable these horses are. That's why they do that. Because your your guy is smart. <laughs> if if you don't if you want someone to not know something's worth a lot, you disguise it. Just and and the enchantments are incredibly cheap comparatively to the raw amount of temper that it would take to make something like that. Um, <clears throat> Laura Schick, you're just polishing. I, is that what you said? Yeah. I, while I'm polishing, I, I notice that Evie's just kind of like daydreaming uh and i ask her is this home in some ways make an inside check for home. me an advantage laura Schick, please oh yeah you but you you gathered at least that much information there there are ways to justify that especially in role playing but sometimes it takes you can clearly see that but sometimes laura Schick might mix up signals or something like that but for you personally you get advantage because you understand the feeling of going and seeing home right <clears throat> being away from it and then coming back to it would be a huge thing for you um and you know that in some ways yes in some ways i did grow up here and my family is from here uh but they're not here anymore and I haven't been, I've only been back for a short while after being away for a long while. Why'd you leave? Um, the crag is very specific people and I never quite felt like they were people of my sort. I know that feeling all too well. For a half second, Evie doesn't look at Lorschick as a skeevy little lizard man. 
I go back to polishing my big stick. Do you ignore it or do you take, take note? I assume you take note. I don't notice it because I'm so just wrapped up in my giant. Oh, okay. In Interesting. Head. The whole day goes by uneventfully. You don't see any weird, like, owl gatherings or anything in a natural sense that's blown out of proportion or anything like that. Um, it's actually really interesting. You, The closer that you get to Skjorn's Horn, the more natural things that happen. Like there's a herd of deer that pass by. There's an elk that just runs past you guys in the opposite direction. And that thing is massive and it just woof, hooves past you super, super fast. And you're not really ready for it because it's there and then woof, it's gone. But it's very loud in the, in the prospect. Um, Um, you guys arrive at Skjornshorn, and Skjornshorn is known to be a large city comparatively to the rest of the world. A lot of the world has between ten and 12,000 people in it. Um, Skjornshorn is known to have between forty-eight and 50,000 people in it at a time, so that's spread over a huge area. And the entire city itself has these giant, uh, giant walls that are made of the wood that comes from Turfor. So it's all light gray with the red veins going through it, like the, the the spindles going through it, but it's all polished and then it's all linked together by these huge iron uh, brackets. Um, and it's actually quite beautiful. Um, and then the large gates actually swing this way, so they're mounted on a bar, and then that axle swings this way, so they actually have to have a person or set of people push it open or pull it open with the chains on the other side in order for it to you to move through it, sort of like uh, the gate on, um, what's that movie? Uh, Princess Mononoke, the huge gate that swings open internally. Um, if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I mean. Um, and it's actually quite amazing. Because the sheer scale of this city is enormous. Um, there is no moat, but at the back it leads to a giant lake that actually has partially part of it uh, uh, walled off. And they're currently building the second set, the second set, uh, second section of the wall around the lake. They're trying to completely close the the. Excuse me. They're trying to close off the lake from the rest of the world and they can they're actually building a dam as well at the very front of it to control flow down the river um not necessarily to stop people from getting it but to make sure they have enough resources for them to happen as you move in toward the city um uh specifically you lawyer shik um bounty master sinhal looks at you and he says come over here and he beckons you on your horse to his uh, to the cart. I I guide my horse towards Bounty Master. And get on, uh, get on! I need you to take the reins while I go talk to the guard, so we can just move in without transition, without having to stop. So I don't want to have to stop. You want you want me to take over your horse? Yes, I want you to take the cart. What do you want me to do with this horse? Leave it. It'll come with us. Don't worry about it. It's trained. Okay. I uh. I, I hop on the cart's horse instead, the horse, and... Uh, he has a sort of... Do I, he do has I a feel sort anything? Of, he, no, he has a... He doesn't, because I still don't know. He right? doesn't ride on the horses. He rides on a little shelf that's behind him, you know, like those old Western-style okay. carts. Um, okay. And he sort of has a shelf on there, and you sort of climb up there. It's sort of awkward at the beginning, but then when you get on... This is the smoothest ride you have ever seen. Ever. Can I... Do I suspect anything? Oh, about you uh, you decision? immediately know that those are not horses. <laughs> uh, okay. You have this. I, I'm just so awesome. Okay. Um, you have this sort of intuition when it comes to animals, and it doesn't make sense that this is that smooth, right? They appear to be moving yeah. normally like horses, but something is off. And Bounty Master Sinhald leaps from the cart to ahead of the horses, and then it begins to run at an unnaturally fast pace toward the gate. I, I, I yell back to our group and 
You guys, you guys see that? He does not skip leg day. <laughs> um, and he runs. Is, is, he runs. Is it obvious that those are the same horses that we were inspecting? Yes. Yeah. Is, but if he's gone, drive the cart. Then those don't don't mess up those horses. I I'm just perplexed at this point because no one else <laughs> seems alarmed that this dude is super natural, uh, and I. I giddy up these non-smelly horses that just and they they just keep the chugging along because the amount of weight like just estimating it the the whole cart probably weighs between thirty thousand and forty thousand pounds. Um, and they move up to the gate, and by the time you guys reach the gate, the gate slowly pivots inward and lifts up, and on the inside you guys just see people everywhere. The entire set in the entire inside of the city is paved with stone um and they move your cart and your whole entourage into the city and at the very top of the hill right next to the lake there's a large long house um that has uh these huge stone these huge stone braziers in front of it that are billowing fire um and as you're watching um, and moving up into the city, uh, the bounty master uh, directs one of the guards to switch out with Loershik. And he looks at your crew and he says, everyone good, get over here, gather. Um, we're going to go directly to meet the envoy so that you guys can get on your way and um, continue uh, his mission because he has come directly from Artstat to meet with us uh, by the order of the young king Shiram. Uh, yeah, uh, lead the way. Oh, and by the way, horses aren't allowed past this point. So if you want to go hitch them over oh. there, the, the they will watch us. Well, it's for a specific reason. You'll, you'll see here in a minute. And Evie, can you make a history check with advantage, please? You remember that there, growing up, you're like, I never thought about that. There were no horses in Skjornsorn when you were growing up. None. And you always remembered that there was a specific reason for that. And it's because the main force of police officers and other military people have uh, a nest where they keep wyverns as mounts. Um, what is a wyvern? <laughs> a wyvern is a in, is a less intelligent form of a dragon that only has two legs. Ah, oh, yes. Um, I think everyone around me looks a little bit confused, so I share with them the information that there are no horses here, um, and the law enforcement uses wyverns as transportation instead. Ah. Oh. They're trying to prevent snacks. I see. Uh, Rep Rep is going to dismount and uh, uh, hitch up the horse at the post. And you do. And the, the, the part that you notice mainly is that there's a huge long, uh, same sort of similar longhouse that someone immediately comes out, waves to the waves to the bounty master, takes your horse inside of this huge stable. I want to say huge stable. This is a stable big enough to fit 300 to 400 horses at a time. So you can imagine that there's probably a hundred people working inside at any given moment, whether it's uh, care for the horses, feeding horses. You can imagine it takes a fleet of people to operate this building by itself. Just the amount of work it would take to maintain that large of a building plus everything inside of it would be crazy. Um, just statistically speaking. Um, and then you guys move, uh, you guys come out from getting your horses taken care of because somebody comes out immediately. The second one of you switches, puts a horse on, another person comes out to grab your horse. Um, and they bring the horses inside. And then Bounty Master Sinhalt says, is there anywhere you would like to go before we go meet the uh, meet the envoy? 
The Emissary. I believe he likes to be called an Emissary. I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've seen him. Um, I, I haven't know eaten we... breakfast yet. I'm hungry. I was about to say, even though we have infinite food supply, I know that Lorishik has an affinity for meats, and I do remember a meat stand uh, that we used to frequent when my father brought me here um, when I was younger. If you want to check that out, I wouldn't mind stopping off on the way. Oh. Attempting to show Lorishik a little bit of empathy. Okay. Uh, you, I just nod agreeingly. You guys be you guys begin making your way toward uh, the longhouse at the top of the hill, and you pass by two, three meat carts, and then you get to this one that really you remember strikingly. It always had this very large red and gold flag coming from the bottom of it, and on the on that flag there are two crossed eagles' talons that has a sort of bleeding heart symbol uh, directly above it, sort of like a very a very intricate and well-designed piece of regalia for, as you remember it, part of your family specifically. Um, he always called this guy your cousin. You never knew why, but for some reason, he always did. And you'll never forget that flag because that flag has not aged at all since the last time you were here. And who knows how long it's been. It could be 50, 60 years. Um, for you, that's basically no time at all realistically and as you're moving toward this flag the smell hits you and this guy specifically specialized in what are called um oh, they're called scaled hogs so in skjornshorn and in the plains they have these large groups and herds what i don't even know what a pack of boars or hogs are called if anyone knows what that is, what that's called, that would be. Um, it's a it's a it's a murder of hogs. I is it a murder? Hmm. Definitely not. But I don't know. It's funny. If anyone knows, we'll with... if anyone knows what a group of hogs is called, uh, but they have these large groups of hogs that run wild, and a lot of them have this sort of mutation where they take on a scaled appearance, and what that does is it leaves the meat very not even gamey it's it turns it more into a sort of duck taste where it's fatty and very greasy and things like that um a passel a passel of hogs okay um a drove either one um but I like murder of scale hogs personally murder but... of scale hogs um but the 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 meat of the scale hog is very uh interesting because it doesn't taste like pig it doesn't taste like uh, pork it doesn't taste like that uh, it has a very unique taste to it and this specific vendor uh used to sell entire haunches that could feed a family for two or three days um or a bunch of bacon from it the bacon actually tastes so good and he also does a sort of brisket style smoked hog as well and it's really interesting to look and see his process because he also has another family member who makes armor from their their skin their scaled skin because apparently you can hit one of these with a heavy crossbow on its back and it will deflect it so there are their actual skin is very armored and the only way to do that is what they would do you remember all these stories from when you were young um talking to this guy that they would actually pull a large rope and trip all the hogs and then shoot them in the belly to kill them because otherwise you couldn't actually hurt them without like a proper magic or something like that. Um, so that's what they used to do. And eventually they got into a farm status that they could get the hogs to just be still and not be wild anymore. They sort of domesticated them, didn't change the hogs in any way, but that's exactly what it does. And, you walk up to this vendor and the smell hits you immediately. It smells so good, Evie, that your water, your mouth waters just by reaction to it. And Loershik, you've never seen this before. Because the meat itself is actually a light blue. It's a sort of light blue. And then the charred versions of it are a very dark blue. And it's just very interesting looking. I excitedly like run ahead of the group to this, this stand. 
Um, it warms my heart to see someone appreciating um, the memories from my childhood, but I do take a quick look back at Vidar to make sure that he doesn't have any ill intent with the shopkeeper of this meat stand. What are your thoughts right now, Vidar? I'm mostly sitting there seeing how excited everyone else is getting and uh, kind of having that uh, semi I wish I was human kind of uh, Pinocchio moments. <laughs> I wish I was a real boy. I can't can't smell anything, can't taste anything, so this is all kind of half very unexciting and half uh, um, exclusionary. I feel left out. I I just like I burst out and say I've never seen a meat stand that looks so beautiful before. Um, I divulge a little bit of the stories of uh, when I was a, as ch a child coming here with my father when he did business, explaining to Lorishik, um how how they got this specific meat and how rare it is and how it's only um, very specific to the crag. So he should enjoy it while he's here. I is there is there a vendor? There is a vendor I... and. It's it's strange. He looks he's very green. He's he's also an Eladrin and he has this beautiful sort of um crown of leaves that comes up just like a uh, Caesar almost with a sort of golden vine that wraps around the whole thing and then he has it, it looks like it looks like face paint. But it's very clearly not. It's very part of his physiology and he's he has these beautiful green these beautiful gold eyes and he looks down on you and he says Welcome. How? What? What can I get for you? <gasps> Hold a moment, cousin. It's been a while. It's been so long. And he has this uh, sort of like strangely beautiful voice that is so. Just him talking to you takes you from like not excited to 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 null or anything like that. It just calms everyone down a bit. It just brings you from up here to down here everyone seems really peaceful he says oh i've missed you it's been so long since i've seen your family i, I mean, missed you as well um well, i haven't been back in a very long while i know but i'm glad that you're back what brings you back cousin uh we're here on a on a bit of business um business. we're here to to help to help a. Uh, and I slightly forget an emissary cross the somewhere. Oh, interesting! That's fantastic. I'm so happy for you. Can I get you I'm getting anything? Getting real close to all the meat during this and just smelling mm. it, just to be clear. Uncomfortably close. Can I? Can I get you anything? You and your, a uh, what? It, I've picked up some strange companions. They along look fantastic. Oh, I'm so excited! Hello. Hi. Hello. They, they are interesting beings. My name sure. is Garen, by the way. My name is Technician Rep Rep. Please call me Rep Rep. Oh, Rep Rep, it's a pleasure to meet you. And who's the quiet one? Likewise. The quiet one with the glowing eyes. He looks straight. I love it. It's so pretty. I just kind of stare back. <laughs> I kind of glare back at Vidar and... Uh, in a way that, like, a, a mother doesn't want uh, someone to be rude to someone that they're first meeting. Kind of give him a glare. Make it, and it, hope that make it insight check, Vidar. Please make it insight check. <laughs> Not picking up on it. <laughs> At the same time, I'm kind of, like, pushing um, Lorishik's snout back as he's kind of putting his entire face into the meat. Um, and then I ask... Uh, it appears my friends are very hungry. Cousin, would you mind, uh, uh, what is, I don't know, uh, would you like a, a leg or a full haunch for you, Lorshik? A leg is fine. It's only breakfast. Oh, of course. I, and he, he sort of, uh, he pulls one from behind the sort of stand, uh, thing that he has, and he wraps it in a wax paper, and he hands it to you, and he says, Evie, don't worry about it. I've I've made enough today to justify handing one leg to your ravenous friend. Um, 
just remember, on your way out, I have I have rations. I have rations. I've just started. Very kind. Started. They're actually honey and raspberry. Oh, they're so good. It makes me so excited. I won't leave without saying goodbye. Though. Oh, of course. Come, come, come round, come round. And he's like, he's like asking for a hug. Um, give him a hug. And, kind of reluctantly, and, not very touchy. But and the, the thing is, is he gives a great hug. This is something that he's like, he loves his family, and he just hugs you, and you feel better. As a result, you feel a little bit more calm, a little bit less needing to be attentive um, and relax for just a second. And he releases, he says, Do I notice this while I'm... Make an insight check at disadvantage. You are straight munching. You're munching down. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you do notice it for a second. Okay. My guy snarkily says... I didn't think that this was going to be the emissary. I didn't realize we would be spending so much time oh, here. I'm not the emissary. No. No. Um, and I uh, snap oh, the, oh, around to Vidar. To be. I snap around to Vidar and give him another kind of glare, knowing that he probably won't pick up on it. But I do kind of agree with him, so we say our goodbyes and head towards the emissary. Uh, and he says, hold, Evie, Evie, here, a leg for you as well. And he, he sort of pushes it at you. Oh, thank you, cousin. I'm not terribly hungry, but... Uh, just I'll hold on to it. They me. last for a long time. Thank you. They keep for a I bit. take my leg and, like, waggle it in Evie's face. <laughs> uh, and before I realize that she has her own, she's like, Oh, I guess you don't want any of my meat then. And I go back to munching. Oh, that's a bit personal. <laughs> Run my eyes at him, as always. But with a small smirk, and they carry on. Oh, well. Have a wonderful day. Um... And as you guys are leaving, uh, Bounty Master Sinhald sort of sits there for a moment and he picks up a leg himself and just starts munching on the way up. Uh, you guys pass down a sort of corridor that's leading directly up to the um, longhouse. You're passing by and the it no longer smells like meat. It transitions into a sort of steel forge, a little smidgen of explosives slash firearms gunpowdery smell um into perfumes into all sorts of wares that you could possibly think of there's breweries there's all sorts of things leading all the way up there um and eventually you do reach the gate of this massive longhouse when i say massive longhouse it is it's very clearly either a throne room or some sort of governing person's house that kind of thing meeting house that whatever whatever you want to call it um there are two 15 foot wide stone braziers that have about 30 foot high flames coming out of them that you don't know where the flames are coming out of they're very clearly not fueled by fire by wood or else the flames would be that big um and it's not hot but it's it's actually quite perfect um and as you re reach the the thing, as you reach the entrance, the door sort of swing backwards, and one of the scariest looking people you have ever seen begins to emerge from this. Um, I actually have a representation of this person. Um, you see, uh, make a history check at advantage, Evie. Everyone else is at normal. <coughs> Uh, Evie and Vidar, you recognize this person from your little bit of adventuring, Vidar. This is Jarl, Jarl Hellman. She is a six foot tall human dressed in blue body paint and what are very clearly human bones all over her armor and her body. Savage. She is the most, the recently elected, uh, Jarl of the island of Skjornshorn. Um, she was elected, and uh, her eyes sort of have this strange thing. Um, make a perception check, actually, everybody, real quick. Sorry. <laughs> Evie's a little bit... Slow. <laughs> a little bit slow on the pickup, but Technician, you notice that her eyes move individually. Both of her eyes move individually. 
They focus on different aspects. She doesn't have lazy eyes. She has two eyes that move independently and are all observing everything that's happening. I'm. I am. Uh, I am purposely going to avoid doing anything with that information right now. Um, but you can tell that she has runes, literally carved into her skin. That don't appear to be enchanted, but they appear to be magical in nature, or they were Arcana at some point. Um, but she has massive scars that are all runic magic, runic magic runes that are all physically carved into her skin. And she carries around a large staff made out of some sort of singular animal bone that has been carved with super intricate runes, um, tempered, as well as having a very large dangling sort of lantern at the very end of it that is made out of a rib a human rib cage. And she stands straight up and she looks at Bounty Master Sinhald. Both of her eyes focus directly on Bounty Master Sinhald and says... Where are they? Have you brought them with you? And Bounty Master Sinhald looks down at her and says, Oh, Jarl, I apologize. Uh, these are the group of people I brought to meet with the emissary. Um, this is Evie. I don't remember how to say your last name. I apologize, Evie. Asger. Asger. This is Evie Asger. This is Loershik, technician R3P, R4P, also known as Rep Rap, and then Vidar. This is the group that I have uh, more or less volunteered or have volunteered to travel with the Emissary. She looks at each of you, uh, Evie and Vidar. She looks at you with one eye, and then Loershik and technician, she looks at you with the other. This is when you notice that. That she actually has like individual vision and yeah, she can actually move her eyes separately. Looks at both of you and says, They look competent. Well, <clears throat> and, and she begins to twitch just a little bit and she looks back and she says, Well, let's meet the emissary. Come, 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 come. And she turns around and pokes her staff and she, she walks with a little tiny bit, a little limp, a little bit of a limp. Um, and she brings, uh, brings you guys inside and directly inside, there's a large sort of, uh, there's a large table, uh, made out of, uh, some sort of wood and it's round and it has about eight or nine chairs on it. And at one of the ends of the table, there's a very, uh, very built, but not over muscular man with long black hair and striking blue eyes. And... He stands up and introduces himself. Hello, I am Yvonne. I come from Artstadt, and it is a pleasure to meet you, my new traveling companions. And this is Yvonne. It is a pleasure to meet you. And he goes, and he goes, and he, he, he offers his hand to uh, Evie. I uh, absolutely blushed and offered him back my own. She, he takes your hand and he he uh, touches it to his forehead. And Evie, after traveling as much as you have, you know that like the touching of the forehead is like their, their uh, sort of symbol for handshaking and things like that. Showing that I, essentially I, could, I have given you the chance to kill me and I appreciate that you don't. That is like one of their things that they do. Um, because they are the most warlike culture in the world um this is a sign of not necessarily surrender but the fact that he appreciates your presence and not trying to kill him um he offers the same symbol to loershik what do you do i uh i still have my haunch of meat you know or my leg mm -hmm. and i just i give him like a weird weird salute just <laughs> not really understanding just go back. he looks he says strange interesting uh, he goes to the technician, and he says, Oh, that's amazing. What? I don't want to be rude, but what are you? I am a construct. I am a mechanical life. Interesting. A life regardless. Well, here. And he offers his hand to you. Uh, 
the technician is going to try to do his best imitation of what Evie did. So he's just going to try to repeat that, the handshake and the, okay. the forehead. He touches your hand to his forehead. He says, oh, you're warm. Strange. He goes to Vidar and he goes, oh, my goodness, those eyes striking. Well, I, th- I think, I, uh, uh, hi, I am Yvonne. And he offers his hand to you. I also uh, mimic what Evie did to try to not blend in or to try to blend in. Okay, go ahead and make a performance check, Vidar. Because you're, you're still a little bit off from what everyone else is doing. Oh, you do it fine. You do it perfectly. Um, and he, he touches your hand to his forehead and he says, Well, my new traveling companions, um, it's early in the morning. We don't have to leave today unless you would like to leave today. Our first mission is to go to the unfortunate realm I don't want to say unfortunate, because they are nice and they are quite a people. We need to go to Verdengard. We'll be traveling by boat. Uh, we will actually have to travel all the way up to our our fond Jarl's homeland of Urbolt and Chelfeld. Uh, Chelfeld will be the, the, the port that we're launching off of, and as far as I know, our uh, beautiful Jarl is from Urbolt. So we'll be leaving from Chelfeld. Uh, we'll be... I start to giggle as soon as he says beautiful. Okay. <laughs> and she looks down at you. Because how tall are you, Laura Schick? Uh I'm 6'4". Okay, so she looks at you eye to eye. And both of her eyes sort of meet at the same time. And, and she, I go... And she, her, her, both <laughs> of her eyebrows raise up. And she looks at you up and down, and she sort of smiles. And her teeth are perfectly white. Like, so perfectly white that it's a little bit unsettling. I I do, like, a weird, like, that same gesture, but, like, recognizing I did something wrong, I do, like, a little bit of a bow and go back up and waggle my meat at her face. <laughs> In the, the Jarl's face? Yeah. The Jarl look. Oh, no. Hold on. There's a cat. <laughs> if you could not do that again, that would be ideal. Come on, let's go. Come there on. are two very tense situations happening they are. at the exact nope. same time. <laughs> Why do I feel like Lorshik is going to get us in so much trouble everywhere we go? Um, The Jarl looks at you and goes, Hey, don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> and she takes a huge bite of the meat that you put in her face and and she swallows it whole she doesn't chomp on it I, uh, she swallows the whole chunk whole I I just respond by taking my lizard tongue going <laughs> and that's it I'll leave it there she, she backs up and looks at you and she goes Ooh, we'll have to meet again then Oh, boy. Uh, Rep Rap notes this for later, having observed that. Um, what are you guys... Okay. Uh, are there any preparations you guys would like to do before leaving for the, the, the beautiful green the beautiful green land of Verdengard? I, um... I we so wait when we ended last last night I I really wanted to craft a uh, a a javelin with my necromancer bones. Oh, okay. So what we're gonna do now, I think, is as you guys prep, we're gonna have that after our fifteen minute break. We're gonna go on our fifteen minute break. So if people need to go to the bathroom or whatever, we can do that. Uh, let me just get this prepped for a second. And we will see you guys in 15 minutes because we're at our midway break. Uh, 15.30. Start. Transition.
<laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Legendary Tales. We're done with our short rest, and it turns out that my mic apparently has turned itself back down again because of my cat. Dope. Um, I don't know what happened, but... Uh, sure. Um, where were we? We're just about to leave with Yvonne to leave all the way to the northern, uh, northern edge of the lands of the crag to Chelfeld. Excuse me. Um, and Chelfeld is to the north all the way up about six or seven days relative to where you stop. If you stop for rest or whatever. If you keep going. Because you guys are in Skjornsorn. It takes about six or seven days to reach Chelfeld. Um... <clears throat> Is anyone doing anything before you leave for Chelfeld? I would, I would like to know. Um, are, are we all together still? Yes. Evie, who who's in charge of Scorn, 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 Scorn? Isn't it um, Val, lady that you pissed off? Jarl. Yarl lady that you the saw. Yarl Hellman is the yeah. is the current leader of this island, the uh, the island of Skjornsorn. Um Is she still in our group too? No, but she's sitting there looking at you. Right, 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 right. So she's like within like eyeball range. Oh yeah. Okay. And Evie tells me that this, this I charge. just gesture to her. I say, ah, okay. And I, I walk over to uh, Jarl Hellman. Cross-eyed. Um, <clears throat> and I, I have a private conversation with her. Okay. How does that go? Uh, I introduce myself. I, I'm, I'm Lo. Hello, Lo. Uh, how, how long have you been... Ruling, I I'm sorry, I can't I can't pronounce your city. Skjornsorn. Yeah, my tongue doesn't allow me to make that noise. It's fine. Do you, so, how long have you been in charge? About six months. Who who led this place before you? Uh, I believe that was Jarl Unat. Yes, Jarl Unat. He died of old age. How long was he in charge? About 40 years. Got it. Are you going to last 40 years as well? Hmm. I'll give it about nine minutes with you, but... Um... <clears throat> I would say... <laughs> I'm going to try to be at least that long. Got it. I, uh... I reach in my bag, and I pull out, uh... What looks like a little... Uh, stone slab with some etchings on it, and I hand it to her. Is it written in your native language? Yes. Okay. She takes it, and she says, it's beautiful. What is it? If you ever need me, use this. That's all I say. Oh, interesting. Can I see if I picked up on that? Uh, go ahead and make a perception check to see if you can hear the conversation. First. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna pocket that. She uh she takes it and she puts it in like she's wearing like this robe, uh that's made of leather and it has a little bit of chain mail um on specific areas, um and she puts it in one of the the breast pockets. Cool. And I I just walk back to the group. I'm gonna give him a little side eye, but just continue. A little bit of shade. I know so, so a little eye. bit of shade. Just, just like, just not necessarily shade, but like, what, what was that about? Kind of look, but I don't want to get into a make it discussion an, make an at the moment. Check, lawyer Shik. We have the least I, perceptive I, bunch I I've ever encountered. Yes, literally, the least perceptive people in the universe. 
Uh, Rev Rev is going to say, Evie, do not forget, your cousin wanted to see you before you left. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Rep Rep. Um, I'm just going to go off by myself this time um, and and see my cousin. Um, did he say he had some ra extra rations? He did. I'm just going to go and collect those, have a private conversation with him, um, and rejoin the group. Okay, are you talking about there anything any... specific or no? Uh, no, I think he probably tried to inquire as to, like, where my family is, but I was a little bit reserved and didn't want to respond. Okay. Interesting. Um, you sort of make it back a uh, short while after. Yvonne actually yells at you when you're leaving. He says, let's meet down at this table. Um, uh, later this eve, uh, later, well, actually tomorrow. I believe I have lodging, uh, have lodging for us in, uh, the eastern edge. Um, I believe it was the, uh, the, the Verdant Rune. The Verdant Rune Inn has rooms for us already. I was told there are four of you, so I got five rooms for us. And I will meet you there, and then we can depart early tomorrow morning. That was a conversation between... It was Yvonne yelling at Evie as she was leaving okay. to go meet her cousin. Okay. So if any of you want to um, do anything else, let me know. You, I noticed that there's many shops around here. I haven't been able to resupply in some time. We have a new pocket full of cash. Uh, I would like to go shopping. Okay. If you like to look... Okay. So here's here's how shopping works, generally. Um, um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a list of items if you want to go on D and D Beyond to look for something specific to find in a shop. Go to D and D Beyond, make a list, and then message it to me on Discord, and I will say yes or no to something, or the likelihood you're not gonna find it. Let's do negotiation check or investigation or whatever to get you whatever you need. So if all of you want to make shopping lists on D and D Beyond, and then message it to me on Discord, we can do that. But I'm gonna move on. Specifically for this, with Loer Shik's experience with attempting to shape the bones of the Skeleton King from the last episode. So, um, the rest of you are going to make make your shopping list or whatever. And keep in mind, Evie, are you going to split gold with people? Can people just assume that you're going to give them gold in order to buy things? Or what's the plan with that? Um, yeah, I'm currently holding all of it. One second, let me... Um, I still want to stay in control of it, so... I think people are going to have to come to me to get it if they want to uh, buy something. Okay, so I will I will give a yes or no about whether or not it's available, and then if you want to message Evie about it and how much it costs, then she can figure out money. Um, <clears throat> so, for now, um, Loershik, the night before you're in um, you're in um, Sinhald's uh, Sinhald's tent, and you are pulling out the, the, the bones of the Skeleton King to try and fashion a javelin out of his bones. You dump them out on the ground. They make the rattling noise and the jaw, the, 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 the did you take his, no! Get down! You're gonna turn my computer I didn't take off. His, no. Sorry, my cat likes to turn my computer off because she wants me to play with her. Cupcake! Cupcake, stop it! Um, you did, did you take a skull or no? I don't believe I did. Well, it's in there. Not intentionally. Oh, okay. Just scooped up all the bones. You said you scooped up the bones. You didn't remember yep. putting the skull in there, but the skull is in there, and it falls onto the ground. And the first thing that you notice about this skull, and Evie, you are meditating at this point. So what I need you to do is make a perception check at disadvantage, please, to see if you hear any of this. So we're, we're sort of doing a little bit of retcon. This is the night before to figure out his... Uh, you don't really hear a lot. You hear a little bit of whispers of him apparently talking to himself. Um, Loershik, the first thing you notice is the bottom part of this skull, the jawbone, has an iron plate drilled into it. It is bolted to the jawbone of the skeleton. And at the very crown of his eyebrows, where his eyebrows should be, there's a large metal iron plate that goes directly up 
and then goes to a tip on the very front of it. And on the front of that, there is a bird, uh, basically a feather carved into that iron plate that is bolted to the front of a skull. Uh, can I do an arcana check to see if it's magical at all still? Sure! I just, <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> you can't win. Um, and the second that you put, the second that you put down the skull... It sort of looks at you, and you hear in your mind, it, it, and for some reason the skull begins to jump up and down with the jaw beginning to flap. What's your deal? What are you doing with my bones? I quickly scutter over to my maul and put my hand on it and get ready to, like, go to smash it. Right. That's your first reaction. It's to smash the skull that's talking to you. And it's sort of hopping up and down on the wooden floor as you're doing this. Uh, I'm going to change the music to a little bit of a... A little bit of a spoopy music. Not too spoopy, obviously. Um, It's hopping up and down. Who are you? Oh. I'm what they refer to as the old king. That's what they used to say. That's what they call me now. It's not my previous name. Who's they? They. The ancient spirits from the second age. The age of the tears of God. And the soul forged. How, how are you talking to me? You touched my bones, I came into your head, sort of inserting myself in a sort of parasitic manner. It's not really the best and the most optimal version of our current situation, but I'm here, and you've got to deal with it. What? Why? I, I don't understand... You released just but how did, how did you get in my bag? The seal was released on my coffin. You touched my bones. I had a curse set upon me, and now my curse is set upon you. What c curse? Oh, it's just what me curse? existing with you forever. I'm here now. So, well, I don't want you here. Oh I, yeah, I good luck with that. I You, you go, I go to swing it at him. <laughs> and he dodges out of the way. You cannot hit this skull, no matter how hard you try. I I just... It bangs on the ground right next to his skull. I just let out a big sigh. Do I notice the big bang? Oh, absolutely. It shudders you out of your, out of your meditation. So, at first I'm startled and immediately go to scold... Lorishik for breaking my meditation yet again. Um, but I realize that... Do, can, do I realize that the bones are doing anything? But like, are they moving? Or are they just, like, in a pile and he's the only one that can talk to them? Uh, there's a pile of bones, but there's no skull. I don't see a skull. No, he's just hitting... Try, like, he's literally trying to smash the ground and you're not really sure what he's doing. Okay, then I... I turn to him and... kind of yell... What the hell are you doing? Just smashing your, your weapon on the ground at this hour. Do I recognize that she can't see the skull? Make an insight check. <laughs> Not really, no. You're like... You're very confused. Do, do you not see him? See who? The, the king. He's right here. Yes, I see the bones of the king that we killed. I just, I just resign to the fact that I might be tired. <laughs> I'm sorry, Evie. I, I didn't mean to startle you. I kind of shake it off and go back to meditating. 
Okay. I, uh, I, I look to the king and I, I ask, so you're with me forever. What does that mean? I'm with you forever. It's quite a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good time. So, uh, what happens now is you're going to attempt to shake my bones into a javelin. To what end, I don't know. But if you like to do that, I recommend this one. And he sort of hops over and he grabs a bone and he like, pulls it in front of you. And he pulls like all the bones together. He says, you probably make five or six realistically if you do it right. Just know okay. they'll be sitting here judging you the entire time. Judging I you. reluctantly. I'm a judge. Yet. I judge people. I I smack the skull with the back of my hand. It doesn't I'm do nothing. To... You know, it's like I'm not real and I'm here right now. I'm here forever. Forever. You know you're sufficiently annoying. Oh, you'd have no idea. I I craft these six javelins, but one of them is slightly stunted because I, I ran out of materials, so it's a little shorter than the rest. But Oh, look, it's, it's you functional. compared to your family. <laughs> oh, what a joke, in it? I I grab the blanket from my bed, and I, I throw it at the skull. Just because I got a blanket on me doesn't mean you can't hear me, you know. I know you can fucking hear me. Don't you lie, you son of a bitch. Come on, move on, move on. I grab the blanket off oh. and I say, shut up! No, I'm not going to. You know who's not going to sleep well tonight? You. I'm just joking. Fine. Of course I'll let you sleep. I'm not a madman. If you die, I die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die either. I mean, I realistically, I think you can get me out of your head, right? But the issue is you have to find another object to store me in for the time being. And we got to get a little bit of uh, ingredients as well for this sort of ritual. Okay. You get what, what would be most comfortable for you? What do you mean? Well, I'm here. I don't... you're going to hang out. I mean, a pillow would be nice. If you could get me like a little rest pillow or something. I grab one of the pillows off my bed. Oh, like, oh, you know, it would be it, awesome. It's like a little sleep. bag. Just a little bag that I could put, put my head, don't, put don't my head in. What? Don't. Okay, right. I'm sorry. I'm cursed to exist forever. And I'm sorry that you managed to touch me and we're part of a thing now. I didn't want it. You didn't want it. But we're here now, right? So let's not make it Fine. a joke. Let's just. We can, you we get can me a little to, cheeky. Find... Uh, and you can even see in it. Just get me a little cheeky like bag on your side. I'll take up that little bit of Fine. space. Put you put a little bit of cash money in there because I like the jingling of quiet. coins. What? If you promise to stay quiet, we can go to a shop tomorrow. I and don't I get you no. a bag oh, and a pillow. Cheeky. I like it. I like it a lot. So, here's the plan. All right. This sounds good. But here's the thing, though, is I can give you a little bit of tactical advice. As long as I, as long as you let me out, right? So if you're prepping for combat or something, um, you let me out, and I'll like point you in the direction of the bad ones. I am an ancient king, after all. I've seen my sort of combat with some nasty ass creatures. We could do it, but not in like a weird I, way. I, Don't I, make it weird, right? Don't make it fucking weird. Okay. While while I'm talking to him, I I get a better look at the metal plate on his head, and. Can I do a history check to see sure. if I recognize the feather? Sure. Come on! <laughs> you have no idea. But you, I, I imagine okay. I imagine you have like a little notepad or something that you're taking notes on, like trying to describe it. Just like, just for your own mental health, I guess, at this point. Okay. I I would like to, to get some rest. I... Haven't eaten. I'm. Would you like me to sing you a song? I can't wait. Of my people. No. Because I could do it. Yes. Sh sure. Yeah. If that if that will help you and wear you out, so you don't talk for the rest of the night. You, sing you, sing your song. You do know that I don't wear out, right? Just, I exist. I, I don't I breathe. I don't rest, sleep. So. I will watch you while you're sleeping, though. I want you to know. 
I'm sort of like a fucked up guardian angel. Are you likes... gonna watch me or watch if, over if, me? Oh, I know. I'm watching you. I'm not watching over you. I don't really give a shit. I take off my clothes and exper expose my bare ass to this guy. Oh, that's hot. Okay. I mean, if you don't want a real pun, I mean, I would have had a boner right now if I was real. I mean, look at it. It's all scaly and... I pick up one of the bones on the ground Sort of moist. Oh, oh, I like that. You're cheeky. Cheeky! I like it. Lay down. I'll paint you. Mm. I, I I go lay in bed. And, and just... I I take another pillow and put it over the other side of my... My oblong lizard head in, in hopes that I can't hear anything. Oh. Are you sleeping yet? Shut up! <laughs> no, sick. I know you can hear me. How do you know my name? I'm in your head, literally. Please. Please leave me alone. Okay. Good night. I just want to sleep. Good night. Good night. And you go to sleep. And you wake up the next morning and he's gone. All right. Okay. I'll roll above a six eventually. Don't worry, guys. Yeah. It'll, it'll be accidental PvP. That's what's going to happen. Go ahead. Was there any chance that I heard any of him talking to himself uh, for, the, for that entire night? Make another perception check at disadvantage, please, because you went right back into your trance. And this conversation only happened for a few for a few minutes. No, not at all. Um. Okay, so Warforged, Warforged were both outside the tent. Yeah. However, their their whole century sleep, they still see in here. Yep. Uh, I, you um, both of you can make it the uh, perception check is disadvantage if you'd like to do that. Okay. Because you're a going through a bunch of walls of a magical tent, so yeah, the likelihood that you're going to actually hear it and understand it are very low. <laughs> no. Negative. Yeah, you didn't okay. hear any of it. Even the group with... is doing solid. <laughs> that was a disadvantage. That was that was. Oh no, they were both terrible. Never mind. They were both bad. <laughs> both of you rolled poorly. Yes. <laughs> wow. Shout out to the two crew. Um. <clears throat> uh, you guys awaken the next morning, and then we'll fast forward to the time in which we currently are. Has everyone put together a shopping list, or no? I, I'm not shopping. You're not shopping. Duly noted. Yeah, nothing to buy. Yeah. Also not shopping. I might have missed that part. Where in um, D and D Beyond do we do that? Uh, just go to if you go to D and D Beyond, and you just go to uh, game rules, and then you go to equipment. Uh, just look through that list, and if there's anything that you need, preferably not magical, non-magical items, because you, you guys already know the rules. Magic items are extremely rare, um, even more so than everything else. Uh, if you're looking for anything specific, just message me with a cost and or not with a cost, but just message me and I'll tell you if they have it or not. Or if they if they're unlikely to have, we could roll for it, et cetera, et cetera. We can just go through that process separately. Um, I just don't want to take too much time for everyone shopping and doing other things. You get what I mean? Yeah, I'll I'll skip for now. I don't need anything. Okay. Um. So, uh, you get to the uh the green rune, and it's actually a fairly decently large um. A decently large, uh, sort of in style Tudor style house um, that has a bunch of rooms on the second floor and a little sort of bar seating eating area at the bottom. Um, you get inside, and one of the things you notice is that there's no barkeeper. There's no barkeep. There's no attendant or whatever. Um, and uh, on one of the shelves, there's a bunch of key rings with uh, each of your names on there, surprisingly, somehow. I'm not really sure how that works, but there's a bunch of keys. There's four keys in a row that have each of your names on them. And if uh, is anyone arriving separately from anyone else? Laura Schick is obviously looking for some supplies. Arriving later, technician and Vidar could be there. It depends on what Vidar wants to do. And technician, are you are you doing anything specific outside of just going straight there? And um. No, I'm not doing anything specific. Because you guys no, did I just, arrive. I, I basically go directly there. You guys yeah. did arrive early evening. So it was it was like people were tearing down carts, that kind of thing. Um, it was getting dark. 
By the time you finish your conversation with the Jarl and Yvonne, um, it will be dark. So it's about nighttime. Um, technician is heading straight there. Vidar, what are you doing? Uh, I'm going right there as well. Okay. I don't have any shopping or anything to do. Uh, Evie, you have your conversation with your cousin. Are you doing anything after that? Uh, no, probably join the te- uh, robot boys after. Okay. And then Lawyer Schick, you said you were shopping. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just have a couple things I need to find. Okay, so just message me and we'll we'll get that we'll get that solved. Okay. Actually, I guess oh, we'll kind yeah. of hang around the shops because if I have all the money, oh, yeah. I know that he might need money, so I'm just gonna kind of hang around the outside of where That's the shops are. Probably three gold at most, if considering the like the proportions and things that you would need, it wouldn't be that expensive. Okay. Do I do I need to go into a specific shop to find this, or do we just assume? Uh, no. There's a bunch of cloth vendors, and they just sell bags, and some of them spell, spell, uh, sell, like, traveling equipment, and some of them are, like, for valuables, exchange, that kind of thing. You assume that it's sort of like a combination of travel plus uh, luxury, sort of, because you're a fan of, like, the high-style living, so you know the difference between someone just selling bags that are for traveling and then someone selling bags to keep valuables in, you probably go to the one of the, cause you're a little bit more educated on that, on that aspect. So, yeah, I, uh, I look for a, a teal bag similar to my robes. Okay. That's gold trim. Dope. Um, you know, just a typical good, good sized bag and, uh, maybe a black, black pillow. Okay satin or velvet something okay um cool yeah um they sell you they sell you like a teal leather pouch um with uh with a sort of lining in it that makes it waterproof and then like a little a little pillow that can go inside there um and as soon as you set that up and you like put it on your bag it feels like it weighs a little bit all of a sudden almost like it's full after you like put it on uh, your belt i while it's on my belt, I kind of use my finger, my talon, claw, fingered things, and just kind of pry it open a little bit and look inside. Oh, hi, hello, hello. And uh, I just close it back up, tighten it again. Goodbye. Did uh, did Laura Shook have to ask me for the money for that at any point, or do you have I some had... on you? Okay. I have some on me. You said it was three gold? Yeah, three gold. Oh, I never added the uh, gold that I stole from the chef to my stuff. Oh, How much did you say that I had? Five. You, you, you had five, and then you spent five. It was like ten gold at most. Okay. Okay. Uh, you guys uh, get back to the inn. And you sleep for the night. Um, and then Evie, being the early awakener that she is, along with Vidar and Technician. Technician, do you leave the room early or no? Uh, yeah. So, um, I, I, I guess I guess realistically, uh, Technician just attempts to um, do his, his sentry rest for uh, basically just like a specific amount of time every time. So he got there early. He started early. He's going to get up early. Okay easy yeah um you awaken a little bit actually even earlier than evie and you head down and yvonne comes out a little bit after you dressed in he looked like a noble to begin with and he's wearing really really nice leather like almost leather armor ish it was studded leather um but this time he comes out in that same armor but it looks slightly different and he has this huge fur cloak um that uh make a nature check for me nature check got it uh dire wolf fur okay and it's bl- ah, it's black I... it's black with white white patterning on it i see you are dressed for cold weather are these climates not accustomed for you oh uh i am originally from the northern area of Artsat, but this area has a little bit of more wind than i expected so i dressed I a little bit more for the cold, especially if we are traveling that far. Um, uh, where are your companions? Are you just the early riser of the group? I am today. Ah, I see. 
That I appreciate that. I am an early riser as well myself. So, uh, if yeah. I don't, we don't need to awaken them yet. But uh, I have uh, one of my uh, personal companions uh, crafting us a breakfast at the moment. Ah, I am sure it will be most enjoyable for you. Oh, it will absolutely. Um, it's actually from my home. Uh, from my home, we have uh, some of the. Uh, how you say, um, not harpy. Uh, basically, these creatures that we have, they're sort of impish, but they are avian in nature, and we take their meat and we make it into sausage, and it's absolutely delicious. And then we take their eggs that are technically fiend eggs, but they're quite delicious. Um, Can't you? No, not at all. We do not eat humanoid. Those are people. We do not. I did not mean to offend. No, that no, was no, the only no, description no offense. I could think of. No offense. We don't deal with the little bird people, especially when I've only ever seen one of them. Um, in my homeland, we have these versions of harpies that are terrifying, except they are actual beasts or technically a sort of monstrosity that um are quite delicious. So I'm making sausage and egg, and then I believe he's making a cake. Well, a breakfast cake of some sort, and then we have potatoes, and uh, yeah, that's what we're making this morning. Uh, servant! And this little terrifying, even for technician, this three foot tall porcelain doll comes shambling out on all fours. It has a perfectly human face. Perfect human face looks very flesh-like comes walking out on all fours and it says yes master how can i help will you finish breakfast and then uh, i will dismiss you and we can be on our way breakfast is almost finished and it sort of waddles back into the thing and you can hear the sizzling and things like that Is that your homunculus? It is. Fascinating. So I was not it, aware that you. That I was not aware that you were uh, also a gifted artificer. I am not an artificer. He was made for me as a gift by the King Shira Montaigne de Fort. Ah, that is an excellent gift. It is. It was uh, apparently if, extremely expensive, and honestly, if, one if of not slightly off-putting. I agree with you, but if a king <laughs> gives you a gift, you do not, uh, you do not, for lack of, uh, how you say, uh, flavoring. I don't appreciate the flavor, but it is a gift nonetheless, and you accept it and you move on. And luckily, I get to put it in this bag, and it leaves me alone because it is absolutely terrifying. I hate it. Indeed. Um, and just after you guys have this conversation, Evie comes out, Vidar comes out, and then I assume Lawyer Shake is a little bit after realizing that you smell the smell of sausage, um, probably awakened by the smell of food. Um, all of you come down one after another, and um, Yvonne walks back into the back. Um, you hear a sort of like strange wooden clinging noise and then he comes out with a bunch of plates of food of uh, the sausages that smells amazing um, uh, hash browns uh, pancakes um, and he lays it all out in front of you and sort of like a giant platter and he says take as you will uh, let me grab a, a set of tongs and then we can pass it around and then we can move on I'll grab a smaller plate um, of food and kind of just eat it for sustenance and no other reason. It does taste amazing, Aye. though. And there, there are a few eggs. They're a little bit off-putting because they're actually uh, red. They're like bright red. And they're all scrambled. I also grab a plate and I, I load it up and I graciously thank them. Th thank you so much. I haven't had a feast like this in oh, it is my It time. is my pleasure. Uh, low. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, is everyone excited to go to uh, Chelfeld and then make a trip to Verdengard? Uh, 
I don't think excited course. is the term I would use. What do you have? Whatever could you mean by that, Lo? I don't understand. Oh, there's just ah. lots of people. Oh, I see. I see. There won't be lots of people wherever you're going. We are going to meet one of the harbor masters and uh, the trade. Uh, 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 and he pulls out a little tiny pocketbook and he begins to flip through it. And he says, I believe the name of the man we are meeting is uh, one Sama. I believe we are meeting a man named Sama. I I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, Sama Al uh, Ahlund. Ahlund? I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> it's fine though. Um, it's okay. Yeah, we are going to meet Mr. Sama. Apparently, I have messed up his title. He is actually the Ranger General of one uh, Verdengard. We are not meeting with the uh, the king or the emperor. I don't actually know how their culture works because I don't give a shit. Um, I've never worried about it. Uh, but we're meeting with the Ranger General uh, about trading some sort of weapons. They have, they have figured out a weapon that's actually very good. Um... And we're supposed to be trading some uh, either money or something for it. So, it will be interesting. Is Sinhald with, still, still with us? No, Sinhald has left and gone back home. So, yeah, I believe that is the first mission. Is we will be going to Verdengard to try and trade some weapons from Artstat to Verdengard. That's our plan. Udar makes a point to... Uh decline the breakfast and I had some jerky in my room before I do not like to travel on a full stomach lest I get sleepy that's an interesting perspective but I don't know I don't know what your personal preferences are but I appreciate your companionship Yvonne you have requested our presence on this journey are you concerned about a particular threat I am an emissary of the most warlike nation in the world. Um, us being negotiating uh, people is not uh, the most forthcoming, especially when we have a history of being hostile to about everybody. Uh, nobody likes us. Let's just let, let me just be a little bit more real. Is nobody appreciates our presence? Um, the only thing we provide is money. We have loads of money because um, we our people produce a lot of things that are traded. And that's sort of my my thing is I, I talk to people. We trade money or well, our natural resources where Verdengard has as many natural resources as they need. So weapons. I mean, we are currently at war with the North. Uh, there is a huge amount of frost giants and they have two f two white dragons with them. We've been fighting them for the better part of eight years. Um, the late queen um, was unfortunately part of that battle as well. Um, so yes, the, the mother of one King Shiram. Um, his mother died fighting those giants. So we are trying to develop weapons to prevent them from attacking us, but uh, have come to the conclusion that we are at the worst part. So, um, I need help from outside sources. So that's my mission, is to obtain some sort of help, whether it be troops, weapons, that kind of thing. So, But we are a peaceful negotiation, obviously. Obviously. I you, see. You are a trade, uh, a trade negotiator of peace for the most warlike nation. Yeah. Because uh, I, nobody wants to fight each other. I mean, every every person life in this world is valuable at this point. I mean, it's been so, it's been so long since we've had a sort of boom, um, and a lot of the diviners of my nation have figured out that maybe it has something to do with our celestial alignment um, relative to the color of the sun. They have sort of found some evidence that in the past there has been possibly some reasoning for the world exploding in life um, relative to the positioning of our current orb to the sun. And yeah, and that has to do with the changing colors of the sun. Um, 
from what I understand. I see. So yeah. The war with the frost giants must be pretty terrible if you couldn't even provide your own escort for this negotiation. No. Uh, that's the funny thing is uh, even the king's guard, there's only like eight or nine of them out of the hundreds there were before because everyone is on the front. Unfortunate. Now we have to pray that still time doesn't feel like killing us at this point. So, Or taking I, if they take our people like as slaves. off. Because Ivan is offering way too much information. You mean Yvonne? Yvonne. Y-V-O-N. Yes, Yvonne. Y-V-O-N. Yvonne. Yeah, I, I I get the weird sense. I've. Would you like to make an insight check? I Is insight the right one here? I, I have experience uh, dealing with nobles and emissaries, so I just I get a weird sense. Oh, sure. Go ahead and make an insight and advantage then, please. Even with that, even that with that basic role, you understand that he's just trying to be honest with you guys because you need he needs to trust you and you need to trust him because that's where he's at. <laughs> he has no one else, and there's no one else to help him. And if he fails his mission, the fate of his country could be that everyone dies. So if if he doesn't trust you and you don't trust him, it's not a good deal. It's a poor deal on everyone's at on everyone's part. Heard. So he's telling you all this information because you asked. He has no reason to lie. If anything, that puts him in a worse position. If you get what I mean. Well, what are okay. you doing, Evie, well, during this conversation? Just real quick. I want to see. I want to see how everyone's feeling listening and taking it in i had the same feeling that maybe there was something disingenuine but i think that's a um that's a unfortunate repercussion of just past experiences with i mean even just small things like our previous mission where we didn't know about the um what is it soul what was it what is it soul, soul stitcher Searching. Um, we didn't have that information before, even though the person was being genuine. So just a bit apprehensive, a little bit on guard of like what we might encounter um, on this journey there. Oh, um, yeah, that that makes sense. Being a little wary of your surroundings when you've ex yeah. literally been there to experience one of the worst things that can happen to a person. Yeah, I get that. Um, if you want to make if you would like to make an insight check at normal, you can do that as well. Yeah. He's yeah, he's being honest with you. Um even with your role. It's not particularly high, but it's not super low. Um He doesn't give you he doesn't say anything negative. It doesn't he's not if he's lying, he's doing a damn good job, but he seems to be very open to the fact that communication is what makes people stay alive, especially after um, if, if everyone would like to make, would like to make a uh, medicine check or a perception check, you can choose. Oh my gosh. Technician starting off strong. Uh, Vidar. Um, he has a handful of facial scars and on the parts of his body, you can see outside of his armor. He appears to have been burned. He has a lot of burn markings. Um, this guy has seen a battle more than once in his life. Um, and he doesn't really seem like the kind of person that can't handle himself in combat. He appears to be proficient in some way, shape, or form. Uh, he doesn't appear to be carrying weapons at the moment. Um, but you know that people have skills and some people are better than others at hiding things. Um, yeah. And then, uh, Evie, you also notice that he's a little bit scarred, a little bit here and there. And being from a warlike country, he's actually probably fought with frost giants because that burn mark that Vidar, you could see, is very clearly a frostbite scar. It has been healed with magic, but it was very clearly like a cold damage or something happened to him that caused a permanent 
issue for him in some way, shape, or form. So um, I'd like to inquire as to how he that we notice his scars and inquire as to how he got them specifically. Uh, are you asking about a specific one? Because he has a, he has a handful of facial scars, and then as the farther you move along his body, the the larger and more um, covering the scars get. Well, there they you said that they obviously come came from a frost like magic, right? So, kind of just general inquiry as to how he got those. Well, there was this one guy that attempted to kill the young king, and I was in his presence, and I had no weapons on him at the time because the young Shiram does not approve of physical violence in some cases. And um, he attacked the young king, and uh, the man attempted to bite me. He bit a bite. part of my flesh off, so I gouged his eyes out. And I let him so bleed out and die. I was, so you're skilled in combat, though. I defended my king to the best of my ability. Fighting in melee is not my thing, especially when I'm without a weapon. But I did what I had to, defended my king, and here I am. So these, all of these scars, for me, are memories of survival. Because in this world, at the moment, it does not seem to be that only the strong survive would be the word I would use. Is that would be the, the, the key description I would use for my current situation. And I am the strong, and I will survive. But the reason I brought you here is because teams and groups of people are much stronger than individuals. If you understand. I do. So, I'm trying to bring us together to make a strong entity in order to A, help me survive, and B, bring a little bit more prosperity to my nation so that we can push the Frost Giants back and live, and live in a better situation than we currently are. That all makes sense. That's all. And then he pulls up his chest, and there's a giant hand print all along his stomach where most of his flesh was actually removed completely. He says, there was one time that I was at the front, and we're supposed to be having a meeting with the generals, when a frost giant appeared. Uh, he ran over the walls and reached into the tent and picked me up, and he almost crushed me. Um, I had most of my flesh removed by the frostbite that was generated by how cold he was. Uh, but luckily, a healer was there to restore my flesh, and I am left with this huge scar. So, just to put everything on the table, I have almost died many times. But like I said, my personal philosophy is oh, the strong will survive, and I am strong. Well, I hope you don't have a, an affinity for attracting scary beasts along the way oh of course not uh beasts are no issue for me the scariest beast in the world is a person with malicious intent because people are smart beasts are stupid beasts have one way to do things people are way scarier than beasts what about robots? As far as I'm concerned, robots are people. Thank you. Because they have not proven, you have not proven otherwise. That's all. Has uh, Yvonne figured out yet that I'm not human? He doesn't seem to care. He doesn't seem to have it being affecting him at all. He just seems he just seems to be more entrenched or entranced by the fact that you all seem super accepting of like all the bad things that have happened to him where he might come from a culture, the more likelihood and Evie, you know this, that the people of um Artstat are generally protected. They protect themselves better, they're not open. They're very, it's not that they're secretive, it's just that they don't care to share things. Um, and he seems to be the complete antithesis to that idea of the fact that he's not at all inhibited by the fact that shit happened to him 
and he's accepted it and he's moved on. It doesn't seem a typical um, art stat in the, in, the, in the character of a normal art stat person. I think that nature makes me trust him and uh, like make this group feel a little bit closer that he is also that way. Uh, but uh, I hope in the future that we can learn more one about one another. Uh, everyone has their secrets, and you're more than more than entitled to them. Um, but if you need to know something that will help me save your life, potentially. Oh, and you should know that um, combat-wise, I call myself a bit of a ranger. I know a little bit of healing magic, not a lot. Um, I usually have that stored, obviously. Um, and I would call myself a hunter. I just hunt things. I don't have animal companions like some of my compatriots. Um, but I'm good at tracking. I have a bow. And he pulls out this like really elegant um, tempered longbow. It looks really pretty. Sorry, uh, out of character. Tempered as in magical yep. or tempered as tempered in Tempered as in magical. Okay. If I say tempered, it's specifically referred to as mad. Like, that's the magical con equivalent to saying, like, oh, it's a plus one. If if I were to say it was superiorly tempered, it would be, like, a plus two. So there's, like, specific terms that I'm going to educate everyone on that are specifically referenced to magic. And this longbow is just a tempered longbow. So it just has a bunch of runes written on the side of it um, that increase its damage and things like that. And he pulls it out of what apparently is a bag of holding. So a tempered bag. My eyes, like, quickly point towards his bag of holding and this bow that he's pulling out of it. Yes. So, that is me. I am Yvonne. And I only have one name. I don't have a family. I was found and trained in the diplomatic arts in the, uh, the capital of art set. Who trained you? Oh, an amazing woman. Uh, her name was Evelyn. Uh, don't. She died early on in the war, um, attempting to talk to one of the uh, white dragons that is nearby. She got frozen, and her body is still sitting in there. And I was there, and it's very upsetting. But Evelyn was fantastic. I'm sorry to hear you lost such a mentor. It's okay, because there are magics in this world that can bring her back, but the majority of them require her body. And that is one of my missions, eventually, is to get her body back. So, everyone has personal goals and personal aspects. And one of mine is to get Evelyn's body back from the White Dragon. And I will do it. And I'm going to kill that White Dragon. He's going to die for what he did to me. Maybe I can help someday. Oh, that would be so fun. Ooh. Slaying a white dragon together. Oh, I can see it now. It would be beautiful. I'm kind of quiet about it, but there is a sparkle in my eye as well. About killing a white dragon we or have... just in general? About killing a white dragon. We have a very long journey ahead of us. I feel as though we should get on our way absolutely um the horses should be ready um all we have to do is go up there and i will exchange my paper one of my papers for it um the kingdom of arts that uh preemptively pays uh, most countries for diplomatic uh quote-unquote diplomatic immunity in some ways and most of that is for not paying for local services because we trade for this kind of thing and let's be real um the amount it costs to rent a horse for a few days is essentially nothing comparatively to trading tons and tons of ore or wood or something. So, pennies. Pennies for pounds. Um, all right. Um, we, uh, we'll go ahead and fast forward a little bit. So, what I need you to do is all of you are... We're going to sort of fast forward our way. Um, you're able to make it all the way past Turfor... Uh, Gunderford, Trimbal, 
Heindel, and then on the way to Chefeld. Essentially, it takes about a day. The way I made this map is it takes two days to get from Skjornsorn to Turfor, uh, a little bit over a day to get to Gunderford, and then the day to Trimble, a day to Heindel, and the day to Chefeld. They're almost a day away from each other. It is plus or minus the whole way there. Is there anyone, anything anyone is doing um, in between days that you would like to tell me now? Because it passes uneventfully. Uh, trust me. Seeing five adventurers on the road together who are A, armed, B, um, just riding openly, most people aren't going to do shit. Because in this world, everyone recognizes the value of a life. And in in the crag, everyone is, res everyone is resilient and... Um, sorry, my cat is messing with stuff again. <laughs> um, Should I put my javelins in my backpack? Yes, if you want to add javelins to your character sheet, and also onto D and D Beyond, you should you can do that as well um, in the add items section. Can you add half javelins for his? <laughs> uh, you could actually make that one a spear instead of a javelin if you'd like. So you actually have like a one-handed weapon with you if you would like. More than happy Sounds to good. do that. Um. And if you want to name it something special, feel free. Uh, so, is there any? Does anyone have any missions or any notes they they would like to take beforehand? Before we move on to the journey from Heindel to Chefeld, or would you like me to describe anything between those two areas? Um, the, so, so the so the one thing um, Rep Rap is uh, is going to approach Lochek and, and say, um, Jarl Hellman was quite taken with you. She seems to share the same fashion sense that you do, and especially as it concerns your art. And he's going to hand him back the, um, the the skeleton king shield and say, you should give her this. She will appreciate your art more than I will. Thank you. I will be sure to give it to her for next time we see her. Right. She'll she appreciate that art of the boning. <laughs> Is she still with us? No, right? No, no, no. You hear that from your little pouch, by the way. Oh, I heard it. <laughs> I just... You're trying to ignore it? I shake my head. Um, is the... Like, what's the terrain difference between... Um, like all of the cities that we've just been through, are they all kind of homogenous? They are kind of homogenous, except as you go away from the capital, the cities themselves get smaller by factorial, essentially. Um, because the, the capital is going to have the most amount of resources, and then as you go farther and farther and farther, there'll be less and less resources, therefore less and less people. Um, and that's sort of how the population of this world works, is that the capital will have the most, and then branching off from that relative distance creates less people, that kind of thing. But then each of the specializations of that specific area, for example, Heindel is not a coastal city, so they probably don't have a lot of fish other than freshwater fish, where che Chefeld is going to have loads of fish and loads of ports and things like that. Um, it's all relative to that, where um, Gunderford and Turfor are lumberjack cities or towns and that kind of thing um trimbal is a lake city so they have all sorts of things that have to do with that um it's all relative so if you have any questions about a specific town i can inf i can inform you about it your character knows a significant amount already um and the likelihood that it, it changed within 100 years is probably very low anyway um and each of these towns is run by run by a, a elected or a state assigned governor in some cases um and the people of the crag if you're a bad leader they're going to out you immediately whether it's you dying or kicked into the street or they tell skjornsorn that you're bad that happens and then the jarl gets to choose what happens to you or whatever and then that's a little it can be brutal but in most cases it's not because it's like you you fucked up we're we're going to forgive you, and then you're going to go do something else. <laughs> so in your time, they probably all have new governors and new leaders, that kind of thing. Um, but if you guys have specific questions about any of these cities, specifically, let me know. If not, we're just going to pass through them for the time being to save on time, because we only have about 20 minutes left in the stream, and I want to get us to a point where we can start 
the next session in a new area potentially but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there there might not be combat in some of these first episodes because i don't want to do world building i want to get everyone involved that kind of thing um if there is combat i will have it pre-planned and then we can adjust fire for that essentially but i'm trying to do the three hour sessions so that it's a little bit pal more palpable for everybody so uh that being said the road from heindel to cheffeld uh, to chef chelfeld changes the main thing about this road is it's windy because every other part of this world or every part of this part of the country has mountains to block wind from one side or the other where the road from Heindel to Chelfeld does not. So the, the, the wind on the sea is very pre prevalent and a huge part of it. Um, and it's going to potentially slow progress depending on when and what happens with weather and that kind of thing. Evie, if you could do me a favor and make a survival check at advantage because you are in a ladrum, that would be great. You recognize that the wind itself is sort of intrinsic in nature to this area. Um, and it's a very cold and piercing wind, the kind of wind that unless you're wearing a full body suit with everything on his fur, you're going to get cold. And the best time to actually go is nighttime, um, just after the tide comes back in. That's the time that you know, after living here and being on the coast for a long time, is that once the tide has settled, you don't have to worry about wind as much, and it's better to travel at night than it is during the day, because it can go all over the place with heat and pressures and things like that. Um, but you can tell that there won't be any snow, in the next few days so you have to at least travel within a day and if you'd like to relay um, that information you're more than welcome to do so so at this point are we in heindel and haven't gotten to the point that we're going to cross into chelfeld yet or yes you are currently staying the night in heindel or just north of it um and you're trying to plan your route and trying to plan accordingly and it's currently nighttime? It, uh, I would say that it's probably early evening. You probably just arrived in Heindel or just north of Heindel. That's up to you. Okay. Well, I'll explain to everyone that um, that I know that crossing this passage is a little bit more tumultuous than our route so far. Um, and if everyone has the energy, it will actually be much easier for us to continue on instead of sleeping. But if everyone is tired we still might have to spend a day in Heindel uh, before crossing again so that we can do it in the evening when the tides are low and the winds aren't as bad. What does everyone think of that? I think it is a great idea. I would prefer I, I would prefer to rest, but if we'd like to keep pushing on, we are uh, we can do that because the, uh, the 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 tide should be the tide should be settled uh, within a few hours and we can leave from there. So it's up to you guys. I think we should keep moving on. Sure. Technician, do you have any thoughts? I uh, I concur. Or here's another plan. Since we have a few of you who do not need to rest, uh, we could sort of set up a chain of horses. And there are ways to rest on the horse. It's not that difficult. You just have to get yourself in the right position. Um... And we could continue to mob on while people take shifts resting. It would, should not be an issue. As long as you... I do like... As long as you are warm enough. That's the key. I do have extra blankets in my bag as well that we can wrap around someone and secure to you so that you can sleep properly. Or meditate, in your case, young Evie. Um, I, however, need to uh, fully rest. I do like the idea of Lorshik, like half hanging off the back of a horse trying to sleep like holding half of a meat bone over the edge like almost like a drunkard but off food i just see it that looks so funny to me so i would love for everyone to attempt a rest in a chain of horses as we go up to chelfeld i will sit gracefully atop my horse cross-legged uh not ever gonna fall off just so zoned in i've done this a million times so i'm not worried about it okay what are your thoughts? So maybe I suggest that the that technician and Vidar go ahead. Um, 
and kind of like stay awake if they can't like not rest uh, so that the three of us can can take turns well i will go arrange for new horses so that we can go through the through the night um and while you do that, I recommend that we have Evie at the rear because she is one of the no sleepers. And then technician, if you could go at the front or Vidar, you go at the front. And then we have someone between and then the Vidar or technician, then Loershik and me and then Evie taking up the rear so that we have at least one person who can grab a horse in case something happens. Of course, I will take the front. And I will be behind. Okay, sounds good. Let me go get us some horses, and I will meet you outside in a little while. Let's wait until it gets dark. Then the, the, the tide should be settled. Um, how's everyone feeling about this journey so far? I think this is a good plan. And the other it allows for maximum rest while we do, in fact, travel at the safest time. Uh, the other thing about traveling in the crag is uh, commerce during the day is you probably saw one traveling group the entire five or six days you were heading north. Maybe one. It doesn't happen very often because it's very expensive food-wise and monetarily, that kind of thing. Um, that's generally how it works. Um, <clears throat> so people don't usually travel a lot. Um, I need to get rid of this token. We're going to move everybody up to here. Um, and I need every uh, higher low. Let's give Chad a little bit of time as well. Higher low, everybody. With your new emotes, you can do higher low. Oh, Spoopy says low. Anybody? Anybody want to speak up? Are we all supposed to do higher? No. Or just one of us. One group? of you say it. Oh, okay. So Spooky you already called it then. Spooky, you said low. So go ahead and roll low. me. Roll me a d100, please. Oh, I got this on lock. <laughs> like, like, uh, we got our lowest roller rolling the D100. Watch, well, he's, he's gonna roll a hundred. He's gonna roll a hundo. <laughs> oh! <laughs> wow! Wow! Okay. Oh, um, in the middle of the ride, uh, you guys set out late evening. Um, I need who's awake at this point. It would be Vidar, technician. And Evie, how early are you? Who? How early are you resting yourself? Or you're meditating and things. I'd probably try and do it at the beginning so that um, we're still kind of in the the foothills area of Heindel, and then I can be more alert as we're actually crossing the passage. Okay, so Vidar and Technician are going to take their time a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. So all three of you are awake at this point. I need all three of you to make perception checks because. Um, Loershik and uh, Yvonne are resting in a very hilarious manner. Vidar, you notice for a moment as you're like looking around at all of the snow lit by the moon, you look for a moment and you're actually looking at the moon for some reason. And a flash of bright red light flickers on the surface of the moon for a second. And when you're looking at the moon, normally what you see is a sort of almost, it looks almost like an eye or like a, like an ocular shape. Like there's, it looks almost like there's an iris and things like that. And the, the, you know that the moon in this world has forever been called the eternal vision even to this point it says once the eternal vision is at its highest looking down upon us that's usually like the biggest reference to like oh it's middle of the night is when the eye uh the eternal vision's at its highest looking down upon us is usually like oh it's midnight um you look up there and just for a moment there's a glint of red light 
And you... Oh, it's Vidar. Okay. Make a history check at advantage, please. Because the rest of you, Evie, missed it by one. So, Vidar. You remember a long time ago. The last time this happened was a very, very bad thing. The worst thing ever. Because that was a sign. That was a precursor to the event that you only remember a very slight portion of as the Tears of God. That was what the event was called. You don't really remember exact details on it. You're not really sure what it means, but the second it happens, a the first time you've felt emotion in forever, you are flooded with a fear. Fear. Literal, palpable fear. Did no one else see that? See what? I think I'm a little bit too far behind to hear. It, it, you said it's the eternal vision, right? Yep, that's what they call the moon. Uh, no, Evie, he... it is completely quiet. There's no wind. Okay. There's no... Uh, here's a giant open plain, so the likelihood that there are birds, especially at night. And if there are birds at night, you won't hear them anyway, because owls are completely silent, and you have all those hunting birds at night. Um, you might hear a wolf's howl or something later, or some dogs barking, or foxes laughing, or whatever. Whatever happens to be out here, but there is silent, completely silent. So even if Vidar is completely whispering, you'd actually be able to hear him because snow dampens sound so, and that kind of thing. So Rep Rep and I missed the missed it though, right? Because we didn't. Yeah, we Vidar is the only one that saw the, the yes. red flash okay. on the moon. Yeah. Um, I'll call ahead to him and ask, see what. The the eternal vision, it was red for a moment. Um, are you sure? Yes. And this is generally not a good omen from what I can remember. Do I have any knowledge or recollection of what the, what the moon flashing red means? No. And and this is one of the first times I've ever said no in a D&D campaign is you genuinely have no idea. Oh, you've never heard of that uh, from the history books you've read in Nilhund and all the other places that have their written history. You've never, ever, ever, ever heard of it. Um, do you remember what happened, Vidar, last time you saw this? I indeed. You... You may not understand the importance, but you probably understand the importance of the tears of God. You hear the tears of God. Make a history check at disadvantage, please. Uh, technician and Evie. Evie, it's rumored that... And it's just a rumor. A lot of people believe it's conspiracy. A lot of people don't know what they're supposed to believe. But there was an event in the, when I say the before times, I mean like hundreds of thousands of years ago, that at some point in the universe, the moon cried and some objects fell to the planet. And that is supposedly the, the as they say, the creation myth of temper that's it that's that's all that you remember that it's the whole science aspect of the world evolving from a magical nature to a scientific nature and a technological nature has they don't no one believes this anymore it's like a fairy tale in this in this world that a it's just the moon the moon can't cry. There's no such thing as tears of God. There's no evidence that there are craters of these huge objects falling from the sky. There's, no, there's nothing here. There's nothing here that proves the existence of this. But there is 
a fairy tale that has that same thing that that that's the creation of temper has to do with the the the, the eternal vision crying the tears of god so i think i remember all of this and in some ways i i guess that technician and vidar know versions of this on their own slightly Is that right? but they're slightly different for them because they don't technician and vidar don't know where this information comes from you probably read it in a book or were, were told it by word of mouth lore keeping that kind of thing where they have it informationally stored in their systems but they don't know who put it there okay or then whether I'll they witnessed with the, it they don't know i'll uh, share with them that i remember hearing stories of the moon crying and magical artifacts falling from the sky um mostly in stories that used to help me go to sleep but um i always felt like there was something more to those and that they came from somewhere um whether it's people from the crag that pass them down or um historical texts that were lost but i have heard that before lawyer shik will you make a perception check at disadvantage please since you are sleeping okay Dreaming of meat. Uh, actually, in your dream, you can hear the old king speaking from his bag. You can't understand it. I just All you hear is grumble. Oh. And it's like so faint that, you know, you know, when you have those dreams that you can hear everyone around you talking, but you can't do anything about it. It's one of those dreams. I have dreams like that. I don't know if anyone else has dreams like that. What? <laughs> uh, I know that dream. Yeah, I do. Where you could perceive things happening around you, but you're dead ass asleep. That's how I that's how I dream sometimes. So mine mine tends to be like Sims language kind of thing. Exactly, where, where you can't understand yeah. what they're saying, but you know that people are talking. I didn't play that game enough apparently, otherwise I'd know what they were saying. <laughs> um Yeah. So that's the sort of strange conversation that happens throughout the night. Um your slow ascent of this sort of strangely well-maintained trail all the way up to Chelfeld is met in the next morning. Um, you arrive in Chelfeld to the sweet smell of the sea. Um, Evie, you are intimately familiar with this smell. Uh, technician, it seems very familiar to you. Vidar, you're like, oh, I sort of missed this. And Lorishik, you're like, I hate this smell. It smells like fish and not real meat. Because I assume... That you are not a fish eater. No. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, Loershik is not a fan of fish. Um, the smell of the sea is gross and repulsive. Um, and you guys come up uh, feeling... Feeling um, well-rested. It's beautiful. And you come out, the open sea is... is swelling and stirring and all the thing and you can feel the wind pick up it behind you just as you come into town the, the the sun is rising for the first time in a very long time over the sea and not over the mountain normally this like in the mountains it, the sun rises about nine o'clock it's like 6 a.m and the sun is already up um where the mountains would be and you come upon chelfeld chelfeld has these massive sea ships um, it has a few long boats that are meant for, like, the crag-type people. They take over the sea because they're hardcore like that. Um, and Yvonne uh, sort of wakes up to the, the feeling of the sun on his face. And he goes, oh, it seems we have arrived. So, uh, we are looking for a boat called the Diamond Crest. Uh, that is the one I uh, specifically commissioned for this trip. Um, it should be us and a handful of crates that we are taking supplies from Chelfeld. Chelfeld, to um, uh, excuse me, and he pulls out his little his little leather notebook and he looks inside of it and he says, "Oh, um, hold on, I believe you're traveling over the sea to uh, Verdengard. So it is just to the north. Uh, we should be arriving." in the fair city of Akkut, which is directly in the bay, uh, what they call the Infernal Bay. 
And uh, hopefully we do not see the Kraken. Or I think the pair of Krakens now. I believe there's a pair of Krakens that, that go into the, the Bay of Akut, also known as the Infernal Bay. Uh, we'll be traveling uh, via the coast, and we should be arriving in roughly five or six days. Um, it's going to be brilliant. I have faith. Right? Uh, everyone on board! And you guys sort of travel up to the horses. You put the horses away. You begin to travel through the seafaring city. And uh, the Diamond Crest is right there, straight in the center. It's a very large... Uh, not quite galleon size. I think a brigantine is like the mid size ship. Um, and uh, the captain comes up to you. And for some reason, you're not really sure what about this guy seems familiar, but he seems like the standard stereotypical sailor, pirate type. He introduces himself to you. He says, I'm glad we're in a new place. I, my name is Captain Salt Eye. Salt Eye. Uh, That's my name. Uh, that's uh, hello. <laughs> it's so uh, wonderful to meet you, Captain Salt Eye. Um, that is such a curious name. I'm so interested in how you received it. Because water is salty as shit, and it gets in my eyes every time I go out. It's a nickname given to me a long time ago when I was a wee lad. And to be fair, it's not a great nickname. Because there's a lot of things assumed about me that I don't appreciate. So, that being said, I have taken it on and I have worn it and I appreciate it and it's a badge of honor because A, I'm a captain now. When my original world, it was not the case. I was a little bastard of a boy and now I'm a man. So, that being said, we are going to Akkut and we're going today. Actually, in about... 45 minutes. So if you need supplies, go get them. If you don't, welcome aboard. Aye, aye, Salt Eye. Aye, aye, your name is? Evie. Evie, it's a pleasure to meet you. And who are your friends? Who's that lizard boy over there? Oh, boy. I, I do my awkward salute thingy again and say, I'm low. Low. Nice to meet you, Salt Eye. It's a pleasure to meet you, boy. And then your two, your two friends. One of them appears to be mechanical in some way. Who are you? I, I, Hello. I went to Rep Rep. He's the mechanical one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am technician R3P-R4P. Please call me Rep Rep. Are you an artificer by chance, Rep Rep? I have been known to dabble. Cool. So... That's fine. Do you have something that needs repairing? We do. We have an internal system that requires your assistance. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Make sure you bring some gloves. Um, and you are... And he, he points to Vidar. I just kind of stand there and say, just say, Vidar. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Vidar. And it's lovely to meet you, Yvonne. Again, appreciate your commission, and we'll get you there in about a week. Hopefully we don't meet the Krakens in the Infernal Bay and we'll be fine. All right. All aboard. We set sail in 45 minutes. And that is where we're going to leave this episode of Soulforged. Um, with that, I hope everyone has a good day. Everyone stay safe. Everyone do the right thing. Uh, everyone have a great week this week. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday, same time, same place. Be there, be square. Um, thanks, everyone, on Patreon. If you want to join the Discord and come talk to us, please come join the Discord. Uh, oops, I'm on the wrong page. Uh, uh, please subscribe to the YouTube to get further updates. If you want to watch the episode before this episode, it's on YouTube as well. It's episode zero. Um, it was great. Super fun. Um and then uh, this episode should be uploaded tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to try and be better about that. I haven't been good in the past because of the Dota stuff. Um, but everybody knows that we're going to we're gonna play this every Tuesday. So we'll have some consistency. And then once the other groups start up, I'll be intermittently putting them in. Hopefully not on the same day. I don't want to do a doubleheader again. Everyone watching right now that's seen that one knows that I was died by, dead by the end of it. So um, uh, the doubleheader was a bit rough. So 
Um, we'll see you guys next Tuesday. If anyone has questions about lore in the Discord, you can tag me in the general community chat or in the Dungeons & Dragons chat, and I can give you further information up to a point. Um, uh, yeah. Or if you have questions about making maps, anything about that, let me know. And if you want to support me on my Patreon, I would appreciate that. I have to change some stuff about the Patreon because I have not been able to do some of the things on there. But I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the subs. Uh, Slickster, thanks for gifting subs. That was great. Um, everyone else who subbed, I really appreciate you guys. Um, I can't really interact, but I appreciate it. Um, everyone have a wonderful week, and we will see you next week. Bye! Everyone's way. Bye! Wave. Bye. Bye.